Hold on a second, Mark. Yep, I see it. Recording is up. All right, it looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to the third annual security school security summit um, that ECMEC has hosted. Thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. We've got uh, folks from all of our ECMEC districts, but then even more districts from all across the state. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I am Mark Johnson. I'm the executive director of ECMEC and I'll be getting us started, but then we are uh, excited to have lots of information uh, for you today, starting with uh, Nicole Pruden, our own network and security administrator, but then uh, Dan Hansen and Amy Diedrich from Marsh and McLennan Agency. We're excited to have them uh, later this morning talking about cybersecurity insurance. Uh, Dan Hansen is a seasoned uh, expert in cybersecurity uh, and in the insurance industry and has done lots of speaking on that topic. So we're super excited about that. Uh, and then uh, Ryan Clotier from Security Studio will uh, join us a little bit later to talk about incident response planning. And that's kind of one of the things that we'll have a number of exercises uh, and scenarios and questions that we can talk about in a larger group or some of you may may go in if the uh, technology gods uh, look upon us favorably today and it works, we may have some breakout sessions uh, toward the end of the uh, event uh, for some of you in your districts to get together and talk about some of those scenarios. So uh, that's what we're excited about today. Um, we don't have any planned set break periods, so you have to take care of that all uh, yourself. When you need to, I think we'll have some uh, impromptu breaks in between speakers as we rearrange and get new slides up and things like that. Um, but um, please make sure you know take care of yourself uh, during this process as well. As you know, we are recording it today. So this event will be available and the link will be sent out to all of you as registered attendees. And you can use it within your own district if there's something that you want folks to take a look at uh, within your own district. Um, I want to thank some folks. Uh, Jenny Gilman is, uh, I know, online, and she is handling some social media things this morning. Um, and uh, she's our administrative assistant and really makes sure that everything here at ECMEC uh, happens and works. Uh, Nicole Pruden, who you will hear, for, hear from uh, in, in a little bit, is our network and security administrator. And John Larson is the uh, person behind the curtain running all the uh, logistics and of the meeting and uh, you may see him pop up once in a while or hear from him uh, as well so thanks to my staff for all the, that they're doing uh, to make this happen this is our third annual security summit we held two prior um, the first one was really more focused on physical security um, and dealt with uh, a number of things related to that and then we transitioned last uh, time we were able to meet in person in uh, 2019 uh, to uh, sort of a combination of physical security and the technology that goes with that, but as well as uh, ventured into cybersecurity a little bit at that summit. And now um, our technology steering committee um, sort of guides some of the things that we do and, and sort of suggested that this year we focus fairly heavily on cybersecurity. And that's something that we as a group of schools have been doing. And I know many of you involved in MinTech leaders and other uh, groups around the state, that's been a hot topic and something that we've been talking about collectively uh, in the state as a group of technology leaders. So it was a, uh, uh, we took this opportunity to make this summit uh, about that. We hope that we'll have a fourth annual security summit, probably be in uh, the November, December time period, get back on track to where we were before. And hopefully we'll all be able to get together uh, or some of us will be able to get together in person uh, to do that here in uh, you know nine months or 10 months down the line, something that we hope to be able to do. A um, few meeting logistics, I had this slide up before. You're a very um, attentive and, and great crowd right now. Everybody muted their microphones. You all have done this so many times. Uh, I say leaving your camera on promotes greater interaction, but of course, uh, feel free to, you know, to hide yourself at times. I, I completely understand that. We just say if you're going to ask a question of one of the speakers later, um, if you show your face, that kind of helps people uh, make that connection and, and give better answers and so on. Um, there's some other things that you all know of. We are going to 
I said we were going to use the polls thing, and then I forgot to do that. So I'm sorry. Uh, you, we will probably use that later on. There was going to be one at the beginning here, but we'll uh, we'll do that a little bit later. Um, but you do know where that is. If you haven't used Google Meets a lot, this will be new to you. If you have, it's nothing new. Um, and then there's uh, down in the very lower uh, uh, right-hand corner, there's a more options area uh, that you can change your screen layout and add captions if you want to see captions and things like that. Uh, from a social media standpoint, we are using the hashtag ECMEC Summit today. So if you want to, uh, if you're going to uh, use any of the social media platforms, that's the hashtag that we'll be using. Um, our Facebook uh, uh, account is there. And then most importantly, at the end, access all the summit resources and, and information, including this slide deck, including slides from uh, some of our presenters. And then some of the things, the resources that we'll be showing and using um, throughout the, the morning are at summit.ecmec.org. And I know Nicole just placed that back in the chat again. So you can access it out of there too, summit.ecmec.org. Um, just a little bit about, you know, even some of you folks that are from uh, ECMEC schools probably don't know everything about what ECMEC is. So um, shameless uh, promotional piece here, just a couple of minutes from, for those of you who uh, haven't been to one of our summits or one of our events before. ECMEC is a, a joint powers cooperative of 14 public schools and Pine Technical and Community College, which is our secondary uh, or our post-secondary partner uh, and, and full member of ECMEC. Um, we break down what we do into about three big buckets. Uh, one of them is educational opportunities. Um, we do distance learning uh, through ITV and hybrid uh, types of, of uh, distance learning. And that's, of course, been a big deal here during the pandemic. Um, we have uh, an ECHO program, which is the East Central College and Career Options Program. It's one of the things that's been growing um, that we're really excited about uh, in that genre is our career and technical education programs. We call them academies with Pine Tech and Community College. And we have uh, eight or nine um, academy career academies that students can, can participate in um, from uh, American Sign Language to automotive to IT, business, early childhood education. Uh, there's a liberal arts academy. Um, and there's a medical uh, careers academy, and there's a couple of them that I'm manufacturing, um, and uh, and EMT, I believe, are the academies that we offer through our ECHO program. We're really excited about that. A big part of what we did in the pandemic uh, involved a digital navigators program, where we trained uh, individuals in each of our districts to help families who were having issues with distance learning because of uh, internet access for one, device access for two, uh, and anything else that they might have been having problems with. Our second bucket is classroom technology. We do professional development uh, for teachers around uh, technology. We have a lending library of gadgets and, and different technology tools that they can try before they buy sort of a situation. We do video conferencing. Uh, we have, during the pandemic, have been involved in streaming events like um, graduations and award ceremonies, and that's coming up uh, big again this spring. Um, I think John has a couple of prom dates uh, on the schedule as well uh, for uh, for some streaming. Uh, our our third bucket is what is our largest and probably fastest growing uh, set of services around network and information security, and that's what you're going to hear some things about today. We run a wide area network for all of our members. We have a data center that's co-located at Pine Technical and Community College, where most of our districts uh, have lots of uh, uh, technology servers and other things, a shared firewall. We do risk assessments uh, and vulnerability scanning for our districts uh, and sometimes for districts outside of ECMEC as well. Uh, and that's uh, something that Nicole, you're going to hear about. Uh, Nicole's going to talk about that in a little bit. And we do professional development for technology staff. Uh, and then we do some advocacy around school funding and broadband. So thank you for indulging me and telling you a little bit about what ECMEC does. Um, again, some of you that are ECMEC members, I know some of the uh, folks that are on the line probably didn't realize some of those kinds of things. Um, again, uh, remember that um, take your breaks when you need to, and then we're going to jump right into things. Um, I'm going to turn it over here in just a minute to Nicole. 
um, to talk about some of the things that we do, why we got here, why does ECMEC do a security summit, why would we, you know, uh, think that, that this is important. Uh, and part of that is because of some of the things that we started back in uh, August of 2016 when we did our first risk as assessment um, for the cooperative as a whole. And we worked with a, a partner called FR Secure. Um, and then that sort of developed from there. And I think I'll turn it over to Nicole to take it from here, if that's uh, okay, Nicole. Sure. Yeah, so our first risk assessment we did in 2016, and that was just before I joined ECMEC. Um, I joined the cooperative in July of 2016. Um, and one of the first things that we kind of did is went through that and looked at what can we do to help um, remediate some of those findings and work through those findings. So, um, what we did is in 2019, we formed a partnership with Security Studio, which provides tools to do those risk assessments. Um, we worked through our assessment, and then we started providing more individualized risk assessments with each one of our member districts. Um, and those risk assessment services, they surround um, three different controls, administrative, physical and technical controls. We're doing, we have been doing that yearly now. We're on year two of our cycle to do those risk assessments and show continued growth and improvement for our security rankings. Those also include internal and external vulnerability scans, which we do as part of that risk assessment service. And we also do that as a separate service as well to, to do that the goal is to do those types of things quarterly, so that's um, one of our goals is to do those internally and externally on a quarterly basis. Um, and then we do reporting on those risk assessments. You get different reports based on how in-depth you want those and what kind of audience that you'll be sharing those with. Um, another thing that we've been doing yearly is kind of doing a firewall policy review since we have a shared firewall. That's something that we work with each district to just kind of look at their policies, ask questions. If there are things that could be tightened up or haven't been used, we work through those. And then in the last year, we have started a policy and procedure development and review with a committee. So Mark, if you want to go to the next slide, I think we'll talk more about that. All right, so after doing the risk assessments with all the districts, we found that our biggest gap and area of improvement was the administrative controls. What administrative controls encompasses is the people part of your district, the policies, the procedures, the guidelines, um, how, you, how you handle certain situations with staff, your security awareness training, and those types of things. We found that a lot of districts have things like up here, yeah, that's how I do things, but nothing's written to cover, you know, if there is someone who has to be out for an extended period of time, if there's changes in um, staffing, how, how are we making sure that that stuff is consistent? So we had, we looked for volunteers um, with the ECMEC districts and we got six people, I think is who we have on the committee. We meet every month and just kind of focus on where did we score the lowest collectively as a group and where can we, you know, kind of come up with some generalized drafts or templates that we can share that are, aren't going to be super district specific. Um, the first one that we focused on was a generalized information security policy. Um, so this, we did decide that it should be a policy. I know policy kind of tends to be a bad word because you look at getting your board involved in that. Um, but we did say that we do want board involvement with the information security policy because it's a high level overview, just kind of stating that, you know, the district takes security seriously, um, what kind of things 
we're looking at, so like access, authorized access, you know, what kind of requirements, who, who collectively is responsible for those security things. Um, so if the links to all of this, um, all these policies you can find on summit.ecmec.org. If you want to take a look at that, we're sharing these um, finalized drafts with you and you can, you know, take those, use them as um, templates to form your own stuff. If, you, if they're super applicable to what you're doing, go ahead. Um, we are trying to get this policy in front of some eyes at, is it MASBA, Mark? It, yeah, um, I was just going to add that, Nicole. We, we did submit the Information Security Board policy to uh, Minnesota Association of School Board, uh, MASA, or MSBA, Minnesota School Boards Association. Um, because they have their model policies, as, as many of you are probably aware. Um, so they are reviewing it. It's taking some time. Uh, I've had some contact with an individual there who deals with this. And it's taking a little bit of time uh, with the pandemic and everybody not meeting in person and things like that. But they are looking at it. They were very interested in it. And so that, that uh, policy is in front of them. They may suggest some revisions and things to it. So it is, you know, take... Take, understand that it's a draft at this point, um, but we are hopeful that they will uh, give us some feedback on it, and it may may or may not then become, you know, part of their model policies. Yeah, so that was kind of a big um, a big deal for us is getting that in front of them, and hopefully, it's something that they can share out um, or give good advice on if there's anything that they see missing. One of the other ones that we came up with. Um, was a data encryption procedure. Um, so this is kind of just a high level outline of how to or how you want to handle encrypting data in your district. We found that not a lot of our districts had started doing any sort of encryption stuff. So the, the hope was that we could start doing some more of those activities. And then what we also did is we started doing some PD activities, professional development around um, data encryption since we our districts are you know, either Mac or Windows. So we, we tried to do some PD around the options for both of those operating systems to try to get everybody more comfortable with doing that. Another area which is super applicable now with the COVID stuff is the VPN connectivity. Um, not a lot of people really, you know, they would give VPN access when people requested it. There wasn't a lot of um, guidelines and procedures around that. So we created the template for that as well. Um, just stating, you know, what, what kind of VPNs we allow, who's allowed to use those, what are the responsibilities around allowing people to have that connectivity. Um, and there, you know, it will talk about the specifics, like no allowing split tunneling, which is where they have their internet access is not going through the VPN, which opens up some security concerns. Um, information around what vendors and contractors need to do when you allow them a VPN access. Um, and this is just kind of, we, we talked as a group about what we thought were good things to include in here. So these are just kind of our ideas, our samples. So you can definitely take those and mold them into whatever fits most for your situation. Um, and then the final one that we have completed right now is the removable media procedure. So that is, you know, your USB drives, storage drives, anything portable, because what we found is not a lot of people were um, even aware what goes on with the removable storage. Like, I think we found that there was something specific Maybe it was around like board meetings or something that was being stored on flash drives. And it just opens up some of those conversations about, you know, how are those being stored? Do they need to be kept in like a locked, safe, secure file cabinet type of thing? What happens if they are, you know, lost in transit and someone else gets their hands on them? Are you encrypting those physical drives or anything 
to secure those? Do you need to do that? Is there a better way? So it's just making sure, I mean, the biggest thing is being aware of where your data and equipment is and making sure that all of that stuff is, everybody's on the same page as far as the security around that. So um, I know we have a couple people on the committee if they have anything else to share about those policies and procedures, or if anybody has questions, feel free to let me know. I kind of talked a little bit fast, but we do have five, 10 minutes for questions here if anybody wants to ask questions, has concerns. We tried to come up with like a standardized template for all of these just to make it easy for everybody. Yeah, Joe, you have your hand raised. So this is good information and I appreciate you sharing it. For the policies and the recommendation to have that be under the policy arena, if, if we're a little slower at getting that done, would you recommend still using like a procedural approach until that could be baked into a policy? And if so, where would you, you know, park that under? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mark, got an answer for me? <laughs> no, no I, I don't. I, I would say yes. Uh, the, the procedures are important, uh, and I think you should uh, certainly have those, you know, while you're getting the board policy developed and while you're going through that that process. Um, where where to park those, you know, procedures or uh, other names that people have for those, I guess kind of depends on, on from district to district. You know, there are some things that might fit within your acceptable use policy arena. Um, there are some things uh, that may fit uh, in the sort of the employee or student handbook uh, sort of arena. Um, those are a couple of places I can think of off the top of my head where some of these, um, you know, procedures and steps and how you do things would go for now. And, and they might end up residing there, you know, later as well. Um, I'm, but we're certainly open if anybody else has ideas where you, where, where, where have you, where have other people put this? Um, would be a question, I guess, because Joe raises, uh, that's a very good question that Joe raises. Anybody have a suggestion of where you've put some of these kinds of technology related um, guidelines and procedures? So Joe, chime in if, if um, that's kind of what your question was, or because I took it as if you can't get the board um, eyes on the information security policy, you're wondering if the information security policy should be a procedure. Was yeah, I think that was I was yeah. looking for. So that helps me think about it. I think part of the challenge is we're not probably doing this formally. And, and so we haven't really formalized where it should go. And that's part of the conversation today. Right. Mm -hmm. The thoughts on the information security policy being like a board level thing is to get your board members you know, on the same page around the security, the security stuff and make sure that they're aware of what kind of security ramifications, you know, there are. So, and I think it probably varies from board to board, but I know with the ACMEC districts, there are a couple where after doing the risk assessment, I've actually gone out and we've talked about our findings at the board level, which I think is a good thing. Um, having them be aware of what what we find where the holes are because then they can help make decisions based on you know where should we focus you know the technology budget what things are we doing well what things are we doing poorly um just as you know they're your kind of your leadership group so having them on the same page helps make some of these initiatives easier at the district level. Um, I'm gonna jump in and have John uh, share, uh, launch a couple of polls. Um, there's one other one I should have had, had done that I didn't is, is how many of you have a board approved um, policy related to information technology. Um, but John's going to launch a couple of polls. So if you go up to the upper uh, right hand corner, the little shapes, triangle, square, circle, you can hit that and hit polls. And he's got a couple of them up there. 
um, that I would ask you to go and just for our own uh, interest uh, while we're transitioning to our first set of speakers. Um, have you done a comprehensive risk assessment related to IT uh, in your district? Uh, and do you have an incident response plan that addresses information security and technology? Um, and I sh as people vote, it should show up. Uh, you should be able to see people's responses uh, as we go through this process. Um, so interesting and that'll change you can kind of watch that change as people decide to participate you don't have to participate but um, but we were kind of curious uh, about that um, and then that question of how many have the, that we don't have up there which is how many have a uh, currently have an information security policy um, I would do show of hands but I can't we, we can't see everybody on the screen so um, but uh, any, anybody else, and while you're doing this, anybody else have any comments uh, or thoughts about these, you know, policies and procedures? And we had other names that we were going to use for them, and I don't remember what those were. I'm looking. What do other people call them? So I do want to just kind of say that if you kind of feel like on your island that you haven't, you know, I don't have an incident response plan, I don't know what that is, or I haven't done a risk assessment, don't feel like you're alone in that, because, you know, I'll be honest, we kind of pushed that on the ECMEC districts. Yep. Um, I mean, nobody, like, threw a temper tantrum and said, no, I don't want to, but we, we were in a fortunate position to be able to do that without um, an added, you know, $10,000 price tag to the district. Um, so we were in a very fortunate position, especially since a lot of the districts in ECMEC are, you know, super small and these things aren't, you know, you talk to needing money for these things and the district's just like, nope, not gonna. So don't feel like you are alone in not having the budget for that. No, ab ab absolutely not. And, and, you know, look at partnerships and things there. They're, you know, again, I know tomorrow um, many, many of you that are technology uh, leaders in your districts who are on the call, there is a, a MinTech leaders group meeting and we are going to talk about some of these things at that meeting too. So you may uh, want to, if, if, you know, if you weren't already planning to attend that for you for technology folk, you may want to attend that meeting. And I'm sure that uh, I see Eric Simmons is, is on and I'm sure uh, he could probably paste a link or something uh, for more information into the chat. I'm putting him on the spot. Sorry. I, Eric, yes, you I, want to say something, Eric? I, I definitely can do that. And we, we had kind of just planned some open ended time tomorrow to talk about um, kind of like uh, data data privacy practices um, as well as information security as it relates to, I mean, we're, we're using the word policy, but kind of taking everybody where they are at and just um, mm -hmm. have some time open-ended for all of us to talk through and share where we're at. And um, also just kind of talk about, does that need to change post pandemic here too? Like how has that changed and what do we need to update in those? So I will paste a link into the chat to get involved in that. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. And that'll just be an opportunity to extend this conversation, you know, out further and, and look for those partnerships where, you know, you can maybe work to uh, bring some of these tools and resources to your district uh, in, in another way. So I wanted to make sure to point that out. Um, and again, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the poll results uh, that are coming in, you can tell that if you haven't done one of these things, you are not alone. Um, where we have, you know, just about half, it's just about half and half uh, in, in many, in many cases. So you're certainly not alone if you haven't done these things. Um, I'm going to swing it back to, um, to Nicole. I think our uh, next set of speakers have arrived. Um, if you want to do a quick uh, introduction. Yes. Yeah, so I do see Amy is here from Marsh and McClellan. And then we should have Dan Hansen as well. And they are gonna do a little bit of a presentation for you guys from the um, insurer standpoint. Yes, Nicole, Dan's on as well. Nice to see you all. Good, and I will stop sharing my slides so that if you have them to share, you will be able to do that. Perfect. 
Well, as Dan is, uh, he's going to be the driver here. Um, thank you all for the opportunity uh, to present to you. I just want to give you a little bit of background on why you're even hearing from Dan and I. Uh, as part of it is, we're the insurance people. We're not the IT people. Uh, so you're not going to hear us go in depth on really when we get into IT specific. But what became very clear to us last year was there are big changes coming and we were certainly seeing schools at more risk. Um, so even if you back that up a little bit further, five years ago, we started looking at cyber and going, hey, I think we've got an exposure here for our schools and we need to plan ahead. Because what we were seeing with it in the package um, was not enough. Now, I don't think, I would love to say we could envision five years ago where we are today. We did not envision that, um, but certainly wanted to get a standalone product that could be really more specific to help our schools. So through our partnership with the School Board Association, we um, developed a cyber standalone. I shouldn't say we developed it, but we customized it to the school market of looking at the insurers that are really good in cyber and could provide the best opportunity for our clients. And through the School Board Association, we actually leveraged all the schools in Minnesota. And that's how we were able to really drive the premium down um, so last year, if we fast forward, when we started going into the seven one renewals, just as we were going into lockdown, um, and everybody was going remote, cyber was still relatively, um, stable, I guess I would say, um, it was still pretty easy to get a cyber policy. They didn't ask a lot of questions, but boy, as we started to go to our nine one renewals and 10 one renewals, as the cyber incidents and hacks started increasing specifically in schools, we saw a lot more questions coming up. And so as we were starting to prepare for this year's, make sure we were talking to our audience early and making sure that our normal Well, actually in December was our first presentation to Masbo. And then in January, we really started talking specifically to our clients and then to the IT folks of, hey, here's what's coming down the road. And here's what I need you guys to talk about or to be aware of. So that's kind of just a little bit of how we got to where we are today. Um, and right now, as we're preparing for our 7-1 renewals, the cyber um insurers are even putting the brakes on they're like we've got all of our submissions in and right now they're telling us hey we're not even going to look at them right now because it's too fluid there's too many things happening so with that i think it's a good time for me to turn it over to dan who really is um an expert in the cyber insurance area um, and can kind of give you a little bit more insight as to what's going on. A lot of this, I'm sure, is stuff that you've heard. But then we're also going to move into what do schools really need to be doing right now to put themselves in the best position to renew their coverage. So, Dan, I'll let you. Uh... Okay. Thanks, Amy. Can everyone see my screen? Presentation? Yeah. Yep, we can, Dan. Yeah. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate that. So... Um, as Amy said, um, my name is Dan Hansen, uh, Senior Vice President of Management Liability. So I lead a team of about 22 people that place DNO, ENO, and, and cyber. Um, obviously, we have a, a large presence with schools, so I uh, spend some time thinking about cyber in schools. And just to, just to follow up on something Amy mentioned there, it, it brought back a memory when we were putting together the cyber program. We literally were able to go to the cyber carriers and say, here's a school district, here's a number of students. Here's what we expect their annual budget to be. And they were giving us quotes. That's how simple it was. That was probably four or five years ago. It was honestly about that simple last year at this time, maybe a little bit more challenging. And this year has brought on a, uh, a slew of changes. But And we're going to walk through that. Um, here's just, oops, I'm going to see if I can advance my slides here for you. 
Okay, so here's what I'd like to talk about today. And please uh, feel free to send questions via the chat. Amy, if you can kind of help me watch for those questions so we can uh, we can help out. Um, I'm happy to answer things. So I want to talk about what's interesting to you as the, as the audience. Um, this is all interesting to me. So, uh, but we'll try to talk about what's interesting to you. But first I want to just kind of tell you what's happening specifically in the education space. Um, what's taking place in the broader insurance market? Because obviously that's impacting the education space. How can your district prepare? What are some so what are some some fixes that we're seeing? What's important to the carriers um, from a, a renewal standpoint? So maybe can help you save some premium dollars, and then also important to you because you know it doesn't matter how much you're paying for the insurance if you have to use it, it's still not a good thing, right? So what are what are we seeing some effective strategies to be um, around cyber uh, security preparedness, and uh, then just some useful tools that we have available for you to use. Okay, so that's that's what I plan to cover today in about uh, the next 40, 45 minutes. Okay. So I can't give a presentation without my legal disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an IT professional. I'm a risk management person. So that's my risk management by putting this up to, to let you know that. Okay. Okay. So what just these are some quick statistics and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And, and I always tell people some of this stuff I'm going to go through in the next few slides. It might be a little scary. It's not intended to scare you. It's just intended to give you the landscape of what's happening. And this is not unique to education. This is all the organizations we're working with right now are seeing a lot of cyber activity. So I would say it's not, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be a little better than average or average at your cybersecurity and you're probably not gonna be as likely a target. The, it's, a, it's a crime of opportunity. You, you, if, you know, those of you especially that are close to the IT space, you know that there's phishing going on every day, right? And people are out there and they're feeling around. They're not in, they're not cyber criminals because they're super hard workers. Some of them are, but most of them are crime of opportunity. They want to get in where it's the easiest and then, you know, conduct a ransomware event, um, get some get some money out of you, get some Bitcoin out of you, and then move on to the next next easiest target. Okay, so it's it's uh, there is an advantage to having just some super some some low level um, cybersecurity measures in place, and that'll help you as an organization. So, what are we seeing? We're seeing then some of these stats are going to contradict a little, themselves a little bit because they're from different sources, but just want to kind of give you a flavor. Um, average claim about five million dollars, or you know another way to look at that is one hundred forty two dollars per record. I think the biggest thing within the education space that we see is 212 days to identify the event. It's a long time to be in your system and be collecting data and understanding a lot about what's going on within your staff and within your students. And then 71 days to contain the breach, right? So th those are the those are the big drivers. So we we see that you know they can you can obviously gather a lot of data in that amount of time. Um, you see this the next. The next uh, bullet there is the average breach about two hundred two thousand dollars, which you know falls in line with kind of what we're seeing um, in the next bullet too about one hundred fifty thousand. So th those are and you know we've we've seen enough matters not to you know certainly not going to name names here, but we're seeing enough matters in the education space that that's kind of been our experience too. You know, kind of in that one hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range is what we're seeing from you know just a total cost, and that's that's inclusive of ransomware payments. You know, any business interruption that might result, you know, obviously a little bit less business interruption, but kind of that that infosec, what do we need to do? How do we, you know, what happened to whom and over what time period? How do we how do we bring, you know, us back online? Those those, those costs right there, that, that's pretty much in line with what we're seeing. Um, I think that the fourth bullet is 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 very telling as well. Um, the average estimated probability of a successful breach in the education industry is 45 percent. Um, I really feel for folks in the education space when it comes to cybersecurity. It's, you know, if you're in a manufacturing company and you've got four walls, you've got locks and all the doors, you've got a contained workspace, you've got all workstations under control, um, you don't happen to have students who probably are better at their computers than 90% than of our staff or 95% of our staff, a little bit easier job, right? When you have a lot of open ports or potential open ports, you have parents, students, uh, staff, 
administration, everybody accessing the system and needing different levels of security and things. It's, it's a much more um, challenging um, position. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's, it's a tougher, it's tougher to, to, to build a fence around a school or an education institution than, than a manufacturer. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's where we come up with that, that 45%. So what, I've already touched on this a little bit, but what are we seeing? What's, what's driving the activity? It's, it's ransomware. And I can see about eight of you on the screen. Is everybody familiar with the, when I say ransomware, what, what I'm talking about there? Could it, just get a show of hands? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're all, we're all hearing the horror stories. And I, I, I look at this graph on the left part of your screen, right? The ransom payments by quarter. And quite honestly, our industry is partly to blame here because insurance is paying ransom because quite honestly, it's been cheaper to pay ransom than to go in and reclaim all the data and the business interruption losses and everything else. But you can see the, the, the ransom demands have been increasing. I mean, the peak of 233.817 in what's that Q3, uh, I'm sorry, it's Q4 of 20. No, no, yeah, Q3 of 20, that's when it was. At the end of 2019, that number was 93,000. So more than doubled in less than a year for, for ransom demands. Reason is people were paying and they kept paying, okay? In Q4, we're starting to see less payment. We're starting to see more, hey, let's get this thing remedied. And the ransom demands are starting to tick down a little bit. It's gonna be very interesting to see what the Q1 data shows us, if that was just an aberration or if we're actually seeing a trend downward on ransom demands, but that's that's really where we're seeing all the all the, uh, the claims. And then you you know you, you you look at the graph on the right, you know remote desktop compromise, right? That's RDP. That uh, you can see where where that's been. That's been such a such a driver of these events. Um, I uh, you know last year when COVID hit. We were doing a lot of these talks, right? And people are saying, well, what makes you most nervous right now? I'm like, well, 50% of the ransomware demands last year were related to remote desktops. This year, think of the number of people that are out using remote desktops or in that type of environment. I mean, we're we're basically handing the keys to the criminal to the store and, and saying, here you go, you know, let's let's get better. And that, you know, that's I mean, that's that's what we're seeing. So we're we're uh, I mean that that has also led to our our activity in the in the cyberspace. Hey Dan, I yep. think we've got uh, a couple questions that are popping up here. Um, one thing I just wanted to ask your thoughts on this ransomware. Do you think part of that is also as people are getting more sophisticated in how they're doing their backups, that the need to pay is also declining a little bit? Well, certainly. I mean, that's that's what we're going to cover that in a bit. But but backups are absolutely the key, right? If you've got uh, if you can restore your data and you lose two days of data versus nine months of data, obviously a lot less value to you as an organization and and a huge advantage. So yeah, good air gap backups that are restorable and restorable quickly is a great risk management technique and takes the the value of, of that data down and therefore you know. Yeah, less likely to pay that that ransom or less need to pay that ransom. Do uh do do you want to take a question from one of the audience members at this point, or do you want to wait until the end? That's fine by me. Whatever works for you. Whatever works for your group. So. I see Jeff Johnson has a hand raised. So yeah, I just had a. I'll wait till you mute. Okay, I just had a question. Mute. All right. um, Amy, maybe you can. Uh, you can I just had a question it. regarding um, uh, the standard spam emails that goes to everyone's uh, email inbox versus targeted. So I know that uh, targeted uh, pieces, uh, trying to get specific information, get in there, you know, that takes what, four to six months to do and a couple people and it's very specific and organized. Uh, if you had any information on that versus just the standard uh, Hey, uh, FedEx is trying to deliver. You got to download this. Bam, you got ransomware. You know, type pieces. Yeah. So you're kind of referring to the difference between phishing and spear phishing, if you will. The more targeted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, phishing. It, this all goes back, and we're we're going to talk about this in a bit too. But it goes back to me. It's it's awareness, and I'm just going to simplify that way. Um, you know, the the phishing. You know, hopefully your staff, the people that could actually impact your your in your systems 
are aware that the, those phishing emails are out there and ubiquitous and you know that we don't click on links and we don't open PDFs and all those things, right? Hopefully they're aware to that level. It's the fear, the spear phishing gets a little bit more challenging, right? Hey, Jeff, um, this is that document you wanted. Um, it's uh, sorry it took me two days to get it to you. It might look like it's coming from, you know, Mark Johnson, your good friend, when actually it's, you know, Melvin Johnson who's sitting over in the, you know, the China or something like that. That, you know, that uh, that's the that's the challenge there. And it's really, you know, what we say there, you know, multi-factor authentication is so key. And if something doesn't look right, don't email back and say, hey, Mark, is this you? Send him a text or call them or whatever it might be, right? And, uh, you know, just authenticate that. And it, it goes back to awareness and it, it sounds, you know, way too simple or way too difficult. But, uh, you know, just if it just doesn't feel right, don't, uh, <laughs> see Mark Johnson's always sending spam. Um, I, I, you know, just don't respond. And, and also, you know, you can put filters on and things as well as, as I'm sure you're aware that can kind of eliminate some of that stuff. So, yeah, but it, it, it's much more challenging for the, for the team on the spear phishing versus uh, the, just the phishing attacks. Amy, I can't keep up with all the things. So if I'm missing questions, you got to help me out here, okay? Yeah, I'll keep watching the chat. A lot of them are things we're going to get to a little bit later, Dan. So okay, okay. So just to keep moving along here, um, you know, I think, and I don't feel that this is a uh, a fallacy as as much as it used to be, but they, that people feel this is a big company issue. You know, we hear about the targets, we hear about the home depots, we hear about the, you know the FBI or the federal government, you know, they, all these things, it, it is a, it is a SME or a, uh, you know, a small to mid-sized business phenomenon. You can see that the number of attacks um, between, you know, let's say 11 employees and a thousand employees is, you know, what, 70, 65% or 66%. I'm so, oh, my math teacher's not on. Um, 66% of our, you know, of the, of the attacks that happen in, in, the, in a given year. So that, you know, that's, it's, it's in our space where we're seeing this activity. Um, also, sorry, sorry, folks on the phone, but you can see the public sector about ten percent of the attacks for a lot of the reasons we've we've talked about. Um, you know, you think about the infrastructure, probably have some patching of different systems. Um, sometimes maybe a little bit more uh, dated systems. Uh, we have, you know, there's budget constraints everywhere, but we, we see it more in the public sector. There's certain carriers right now that just flat out won't write it, write public sector business for cyber. They've been attacked too many you know, times. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forward to the next screen here just to show you some of the school district things that have happened. And I probably won't walk through these um, in great detail. Um, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm, uh, the joys of working at home, the dogs, the mail being delivered right now, um, <laughs> let me catch my office door here. Sorry. Yep. So one of the things as we're looking at these, I also just want to emphasize it is in Minnesota. We have had three of our school districts, um, had events happen. Some of them were actual, um, cyber hacks that they got into the system were able to lock down the entire system in fourth quarter. Districts were struggling to figure out how are we gonna make payroll? Um, because one of the things you have to understand about these bad actors is they know your business. Like Dan had mentioned earlier, they have been in your system for a while. So they know when payroll is gonna come out. They know schools are susceptible at the beginning of the year. Right now we're coming into graduation time. That's another big time where it's more of time sensitive. So they know that they're probably likely to get out more. Um, uh, they can get larger demands out of you. So it's really, um, they're getting much more so sophisticated on schools. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, thanks, Amy. So I just wanted to kind of give you some examples of what we're seeing in the school district. And it's probably not what you, you know, not what you wouldn't expect as what you would expect, but um, you know, they're, they're locking up student data, right? Um, you know, obviously, you know, how parents might react to that and saying, hey, we want X amount of ransom in order, you know, or we're going to release this data onto the dark web. We're going to give Johnny and Sally's, you know, personal information, their grades, it's going to be on the dark web. And, and you know, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, nefarious people are going to take that and, and cause some kind of issues. Um, 
you know, like that we've seen schools have to de delay the start of school. We've seen schools have to close down for a little while. We've had, you know, obviously schools pay hefty ransoms, $50,000, um, those type of activities. So just not uh, not an event you want to have happen. I, I find it, this is not unique to schools. It's not unique to public sector. It's, it's a question I get from organizations of all size, you know, like, well, how much, you know, how much insurance do I need? What, you know, what kind of deductible should we have? You know, that type of stuff. And like, you know, we can get them there on the insurance piece, but you, you don't want an event. These events are not pleasant. Even if you have the right insurance and everything's in place, you know, they, you, you want to avoid this event or mitigate this event when it comes in. Insurance is a backstop. You know, just like you have auto insurance, you're not driving around trying to get in a car accident, right? It's the same thing with cyber, right? You want to make sure you've got your risk management in place and you're better structured um, going into the event. So, and, and then that also helps with the insurance. So like, if you look at, you look at an insurance market, like I said, it's it's been a very good insurance market for cyber for a long time. The reason being is one of the few lines of insurance that's actually growing. So insurance companies were trying to get market share so you can see, I mean, that 2.3%, that was actually an aberration. That was higher than it had been for probably four or five years. It was kind of a flat market. We were selling a product that was getting better and better for about the same amount of money because, because carriers were trying to find ways to get more market share and buy, get more clients on board. It's just in the last couple quarters where we've really seen an increase in premiums, okay? Just want to make you aware of that. So I would argue, and I'm a recovering underwriter, I underwrote for... 14 years and I've been on the broker side for 14 years, but the the market for cyber was well underpriced. It just it just flat out was. What what people were given from a coverage standpoint, what we were seeing from a loss pick, it was underpriced. It's it's right sizing right now, I would say. But what's what's probably more important is underwriters are underwriting. So you can differentiate yourself in the marketplace. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. How do you make yourself a better risk so you're not paying what uh, you know, somebody across the street might be paying. I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna, this just shows the number of people that have seen an increase in the last quarter, 81% of, you know, this is Mark of our March book saw a rate increase in cyber in Q4 of 2020. And I would argue that number's higher and it's been higher through Q1. So what are we seeing in the marketplace? This is, I think this is the last scary slide and then we're gonna get into solutions. So I'm sorry, I, just, I, I need to share this with you though, just because so you're prepared for what, what may be coming. We're seeing 30 to 50% rate increases on cyber, okay? Now keep in mind, those, those premiums might've been pretty low to start with, but that's what we're seeing right now in the cyberspace, 30 to 50%. We're seeing some markets just flat out pulling out of the marketplace. They're just not, we're done. Time out. We we thought we had this figured out. We clearly didn't. We're moving. Um, I'd expect some more of that to happen. I'd also expect the capacity to go down. Where maybe they put up ten million dollars. Now they're going to say, "Hey, I can only put up five million dollars." Those 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 type of issues. Um, we're seeing a lot of supplements. A lot of questions around ransomware. Um, and 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 rightly so. That's where they're seeing the activity. Um, and if we have a good story to tell there, that actually helps us as an organization. Um, just to give you a, one little war story, I had a client who they were getting, the, a, the carrier wanted to give them $100,000 in limit on, on something revolving around ransomware. And, uh, but they had a really good story to tell. They had good risk management in place. They had good tools. They had good resources. Um, they had a great IT guy. And uh, we set up a call with that carrier and told our story. And we got $5 million and our price went up $1,200. $1, so we were paying, I think, $40,000 for the premium. We were getting $100,000 for this limit. We were able to tell our story. Why are we different? Why are we better? Why do we think we've done everything possible? We still have a possibility, right? Are we going to buy an insurance? But why do we think we've done everything possible? And we were able to get a $5 million um, limit for, for $1,000 more. So you know, there's, there's ways to differentiate yourself. Um, we're seeing uh, co-insurance being implemented on um, dependent business interruption. So if you're reliant on outside vendors for your systems and that could impact your business and they go down, they have an event, you know, like a, a, some, you know, some sort of uh, MSP or something like that, you would have their, you'd pay 50 cents on the dollar for any loss that's a result of their system going down where we used to have, we used to enjoy 100% contingent business interruption for, for 
coverage, okay? So understanding, I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit, but understanding your vendors, understanding the controls they have in place, understanding the contracts you have in place with their vendors around cyber, it's a very important risk management technique for a school or for any organization, okay? Um, we're seeing some folks add SolarWinds exclusions. So you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the SolarWinds event, but they're adding exclusions. So anything that results from SolarWinds, we're not gonna provide coverage for that. That's a pretty major exclusion, right? That's a pretty important thing to understand um, as, you're, as you're thinking about your organization and, your, and what SolarWinds impact could be. And then we're seeing a lot of basically, I would say minimum security controls, multi-factor authentication almost to a carrier they're requesting some sort of you know, multi-factor authentication. And you know what, at all points of entry into the organization, not just, you know, hey, just this tier has multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication across the organization, because what we see is an escalation of credentials, right? You're able to get in down here because we don't have multi-factor authentication, and then we're able to work our way, we're able to use, as, as Jeff was pointing out, those spear phishing, you know, attacks. We'll be able to get more targeted once we get in the system. We have more, we gain more information and things. So multi-factor authentication across the whole organization, uh, endpoint encryption, uh, segmentation of, of systems. Um, we talked about backups earlier, but testing those backups, make sure they work, make sure that they're you know they're truly air gapped and somebody can't go in and corrupt that as well. Because all of a sudden that backup, which is our our big ace in the hole, if we had an event doesn't have as much value for us. So that, you know, that's a big thing. Um, you know, um, I already talked about detection response. Um, if we don't have these things where a couple of years ago, we might be paying a little bit more, or we might be uh, um, maybe not get the limits we want or something like that, we might not get insurance now, or we might not, uh, you know, we certainly won't get the limits we want. Um, and we're certainly gonna pay more than, than um, our, our peers similarly situated peers so with, with better better controls in place. So what can we do? This is where we, we've, we've talked about some of this, but these are some preventive measures we can do. You know, making sure we have, you know, we, we have our, our VPN in place. You know, we, we have a tight, a tight wall around the information that, that is controlled. Um, we've talked about multi-factor authentication. And with you know, and 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 not just you know, I would say not just IT multi-factor authentication, if you will, but organizational multi-factor authentication. If we get an email, we you know, on a banking account or payroll, a case I think about like five or six years ago, it was in the state, but we had a, a school district. It was the night before Thanksgiving, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving, they were releasing payroll, and the the bank got a call and basically said, hey, well, sorry, change it to this routing number. You, you know, here's the routing numbers for, for, they changed all the routing numbers and they released the payroll out and it went to, you know, went overseas and they lost all their, you know, they lost their payroll. Um, you know, that, that is a, you know, they, somebody just picked up the phone there and made a phone call. We'd have been a much better situation, but they didn't do that. So just, you know, multi-factor authentication, not just around IT, but around any, any release of data or information that just doesn't seem credible. Talked about Dan, back. Can I just yep. jump in here quick on that multi-factor. So far, what we're hearing from the carriers this year is we're okay on the student system this year, that um, they haven't started requiring that. And I say that with a pause because as we've talked with a couple of our clients and with the IT folks, you recognize that yes, you may not, the students can't necessarily access all your data, but you guys do a really good job in educating your students. In some way, the best way that they like to prove how well you've educated them is hack their own systems. And if you think about from the student side, could they really get in? I think there's some vulnerability. So that might be something we will see coming forward. Um, but right now for 7-1, they aren't telling us we have to go there, but I wouldn't take that off the table. Eric, you've got your hand raised. I know we've had a lot of discussions on this. No, I, I think I was just going to follow up specifically on that, like um, kind of number two and number six, like the, the MFA on email for staff, kind of what you were speaking to. 
Like if, if you're seeing that, like for students, that sounds tricky, but for staff, just to reiterate, is that something that you see coming? Most definitely. A matter of fact, um, when we're going into our renewals right now, the carriers are telling us if you don't have multi-factor on, they may not even renew. Not that they're going to give a larger increase. They may not renew. Now, right now, we haven't seen it come push come to shove where they're actually non-renewing our schools um, for that. So we're just trying to get ahead of it as like get it on. And as Dan was telling when he was talking about have that story, this is where we really need the IT professionals to engage with the business manager and give more elaboration. Because oftentimes the business manager just wants to say, no, we don't have it. Well, that's usually not true. There's more going behind the system. And that's where we really need you all to help create that story of what systems are, are, are in place and to further elaborate. Yeah. yeah. And Eric had another follow-up, Dan. He said that's all email, correct? Even if we use web-based like Gmail. Yes. And I mean, that's another risk management technique is I might encourage folks not to use, you know, web-based emails that aren't, you know, under the district control, right? If, if we're allowing people to use Gmail or outside email accounts, you know, that can get, uh, that's just a lot more to put a ring around, right? Or a fence around. So I, you know, I encourage you probably to say, you know, for any school related things, we're just going to operate within this, the school's um, email nomenclature and, and control that if, if, I, if I'm understanding that question correctly. Or that comment quite correctly. Um, I'm, I, I'm just, we're kind of jumping around here, but, uh, you know, log and monitor access, knowing who's entering the system when, you know, and there, there's also tools out there, you know, you can out, outside outsource service providers. Again, I'm not telling anything that you, you uh, don't already know, but they can uh, help you do that monitoring and kind of watch and they're, you know, they obviously know the uh, IP addresses to watch out for or have lists. And so that, that can be very helpful from an organizational standpoint, um, less to worry about. I don't want to, in point six, we already talked about this a little bit, but strong passwords. Um, you know, I've been in a, a lot of classes on this. I took one at Carnegie Mellon last year and, you know, these, these guys are up there and they're, policy wonks and IT security folks and everything. And they said, it's amazing how often you go into a very sophisticated business and you, you know, you do a password run and you see password one, two, three, or you see their first name and, you know, their, their date of birth and that's their password. I mean, it, for an I, for a computer person, especially wants, wants to do some nefarious things, it is so easy to hack then, right? Then they're in, then they can start accessing, then they can start conducting those spear phishing attacks and then they go. So having good password um, requirements and then having those changed over every once in a while, as much as that's a pain, that that's a very simple fix within an organization that can help um, shore up some, some cybersecurity. Again, just being less easy to access than, than your peers. Um, we talked about this, but consistent employee awareness training you know, doing some, doing some targeted spear phishing attacks on folks, do, you know, just learning lessons, making them aware, hey, here's the latest thing that's happening. Um, you know, here's, here's the, you know, now it's not US Bank, it's, you know, XYZ that they're sending out and saying, hey, that we need to reset your password or it may be, just so people kind of have a, a heads up on, on what might, might be, might be coming. And then, uh, you know, I already mentioned verify requests for, uh, for information or, you know, multi-factor authentication across, uh, across all uh, mediums of communication. Encryption, it, if, if data is encrypted, if somebody comes in and you know gets into your system, but if they can't read it, or if they can't read it by the time you discover that it's happened, puts you in a much better spot, right? A lot less notification, a lot less legal requirements by given states, all these things. So that, you know, that, that is a good risk management technique is just, you know, different levels of encryption on data, depending on level of sensitivity, um, have procedures in place to handle sensitive data. So people know what it is, but also then you can show it to folks when something's happened. Okay. This is what we, this is what we did. This is what we said we were going to do. An event happened and this is what we did. You know, you can, you've got a clear path to, to, to show, show your way through an event that helps from a legal perspective. 
it helps from a public relations perspective. Um, you know, it's it's good to have that in place. Um, I'm trying to keep moving here. I do think outside vendors are are good to bring in and get that third party assessment, get another set of eyes on it. I, I feel for uh, IET folks, especially in in school districts, there's a lot going on. Um, and a lot to keep track of, so it's, it's helpful to spend a little extra money. Um, you know, I was visiting with somebody here recently outside of uh, the outside of school, but they were uh, they were going to pay a fair amount more for insurance this year just because of what's going on in the marketplace and the and the condition of their systems. The way we kind of figured it out is they could bring in a third party vendor. It would help them on their insurance renewal. They'd actually be net ahead by spending money for a third party vendor than spending more money on insurance. It kind of hurt our paycheck, if you will, from an insurance broker standpoint, but it was the best thing for the organization, right? To make to get to spend the money there and and try to eliminate the event versus spending a whole lot more money for insurance. Um, simple stuff, but making sure your patches are up to date, everything, you know, your antivirus, all that stuff. You know, I I uh, you know, I joke about this, but I, I I know personally every time I'm racing out for a vacation or I'm late for a meeting, I you know start to turn off my computer and it's time to do a software update. Um, I sit there and get it done because I'm not gonna go I know I'm you know as much as I tell myself I'm gonna go back and do it later, I never do, right? But you you get it done, get it updated, make sure your staff are getting it done. You know, it's I think there's you know not to pick on it, but there's probably one, you know, or two teachers in every school that I'll just let that go. I'll let that go. It's a joke or whatever. And it, it, uh, that can cause a, a major, major issue for everyone. Um, having a good incident response plan for your, for your district is absolutely, um, key. Um, and then practice it, you know, maybe do a tabletop exercise and I, you know, I'll, I'll pick on, I'll pick on any organization, but you have, you know, people know where they're supposed to, what they're supposed to do when there's a fire, right? Hey, we're going to go out, we're going to meet in this corner of the parking lot. You're going to be assigned to this group. You're going to be assigned to this group, but we've got a plan. We probably have a plan if there's a tornado. Um, you know, I'm sorry to say, but these days we have a plan if there's a school shooting. There, we do have, there, there's a plan that we have for a cyber event. I see most often that's the plan that's not practiced. Um, and that's the most likely. I mean, you're probably, you know, depending on what you, how you want to define defend, event, you probably have a cyber event, you know, once a week as an organization, you know, and, and most of them don't result in anything, but, but, you know, I have a plan and practice that plan and make sure the right people are aware of it. These things do not happen on, you know, Monday morning when everything's running smoothly at the school. They happen that Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. They happen, you know, Friday night when the big game's going on. They, 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 there's a reason why they, they target, you know, when they target because people are distracted. So have your plan in place. Um, Dan, I think one other key thing that we learned on this is make sure your plan is not only on your computer. <laughs> that's where we store everything. But boy, that's locked up and you can't get at it. Um, the other thing that I've heard is if it is on your network, one of the things that the bad actors will target is figuring out what your plan is. So they are a couple steps ahead of you. Um, so just a couple pieces on, on that that you just kind of forget about. Yeah, I laugh, but there's been so many times where we've, you know, there was one time I large manufacturer, but the CEO and the CFO are standing on the parking lot. It's a Saturday afternoon in July, beautiful day. Um, and they're on a cell phone. None of their computers work, none of their phones work, nothing worked. And you know, well, where's your plan? Uh, it's it's on our hard drive on our computers inside, right? You know, they, they didn't have their plan. So, you know, we thankfully they had insurance. We got them hooked up and they they went, you know, we got it, we got it going. But it was like very sophisticated organizations um, for some reason save their their cyber resiliency plan on their on their laptops or on their computers. Um, one final point here, and this is going to kind of segue into our next slides, but contractual controls and our, our vendors um, our usage that is we touched on this earlier, but that is really key. Understanding what we're saying in those contracts when we use outside service providers, um, what do, what do they have in place to protect us? What's the, you know, what's the hold harmless? What's the identification language within those contracts? And then how are they backed? Most IT service providers are probably not balance sheet heavy, right? 
um, most of their, you know, their equity, if you will, is in their people and their talent. Um, and they're probably not, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, property plan equipment, things that you can access if something goes totally wrong. You want to make sure they have insurance in place. And then also you want to make sure that they're staying up to speed on cybersecurity. You know, not to pick on solar winds, but, you know, solar winds, um, you know, they were helping out in this regard and they, what, infected 18,000 customers or whatever. And some very big customers with, you know, their, their um uh, information and their services. So just, you know, we want to make sure that we are challenging our IT service providers and vendors and, and really all vendors on what they're doing around cybersecurity. And then looking at those contracts and, you know, contracts are, you know, we end up looking at a lot of contracts. Most of them are boilerplate or they're very one-sided towards that vendor if you stare at them. And, you know, just important to understand what you're signing when you're signing that contract. And I think this is another area that as IT professionals, you can really help your district on because, you know, just about every district is either on Skyward, you know, smart finance, any of those systems. But we, this is not an area of the contract that either the school board or the business manager is typically looking at because no matter what it is, it is still the district data and ultimately it's going to come back on the district. So understanding how these pieces work um and understanding where the contracts say where the you know where the liability is because dan's exactly correct most of it's pushing it back on the district even though you're thinking that it's their responsibility okay any questions on on this This next slide is going to be a little redundant, but I just want to I just want to hit on this um, again as far as like uh, you know the remote desktop top protocol. Um, you know we're seeing some some folks just disable that completely, not allowing people to to access remotely. And I know that's probably not a possibility in, in today's environment, but that's something that you know that goes a long ways with the carriers. Um, as far as backup in point number five, there, um, you know, having a backup having a, you know, kind of a, a, a back with the backup on site and then an offsite backup and then having a, you know, like I'd like to see some sort of rotation or, you know, staging. So, and I know this is, this is challenging at times, but, you know, weekly, we probably do a, a good backup, you know, monthly, definitely we do like an air gap backup that we can go back to and do a full recovery. And we're sure that that's segregated and then probably, hold something back six months and probably a year and, and even further in some cases, just to make sure that you do have a credible place to go back to and gather that encrypted information and get yourself back up to speed. Um, when we do have an event, the ability to prove that out and then we can get back there and, and show that we're in a good spot. It, it just helps us so much in a, in a ransomware event. So I, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough that that's a key to, uh, to protecting the organization long-term. Um, and then obviously the, you know, keeping the credentials for those backed ups, um, offline in a separate safe, you know, location and, uh, making sure you have limited access there and limited controls on, on who can get in there. I think one of the challenges also that schools face, you guys are so good at your design to get information out. You're not designed to keep information. I mean, to get, to, to push it out to people. And that's where it puts a vulnerability on districts and and puts them up at that top, you know, the top of the, the charts as far as for being susceptible to hacks. The other piece is trying to manage that PR piece. Because when we're talking, a lot of people go, oh, our staff is going to hate us if we implement this stuff. If we have to make them sign in multiple times, they are not going to like us. Well, they're not going to like you even more if they can't, you guys can't get payroll out because they've hacked in and locked up their entire system. That one I find when talking to staff resonates much more than, well, we may not be able to get grades out. We may not be able to pay our bills. That includes paying staff. And as we mentioned earlier, they are very good at understanding when your payroll is. So it may not be the perfect answer, but that may get a little bit more sympathy for what you're trying to do if you get pushback from staff. So I told you we're going to share some places where you can go to get some of this stuff. And, and I, some of this is you know, 
probably really repetitive and redundant for you, but I just want to want to share that you know this is and Amy, I think we can share this presentation, right? If, if folks want to get in, and get these links. Um, but basically, you know, you can you can do it yourself. You know, there's some there's some tools out there that you can you know download and install. And then there's full service providers, as I mentioned before. So you know, these are just some of the folks that we see people work with, and they could be helpful to your organizations from a from a multi-factor authentication standpoint. Here's some backups um, locations as well that you can utilize. So you can see there's some redundancy there of vendors and, and a little bit of uh, you know addition additionality. But I just wanted to share that you know there's there's ways to get this done, which is not going to be hopefully you know super cost uh, um, prohibitive to your organizations. And then for those of you that purchase insurance. Part of the tools within the insurance product is is some loss mitigation resources. And you know, last time I talked to you know carriers on this, you know, probably the usage rate is seven percent. They are clearly motivated to have you use these. It helps them out. You know, they 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 have less claims. So there's there's tools within your cyber policy where you can go in and do you know a high level risk management. Uh, review where they'll have instant response plans built in they'll it let you know hey here's some you know here's the likelihood of a, of a claim within your organization and here you know here's a relative cost they'll give you tools to bring in front of the board and say okay this is why i think you know purchasing three million this year we need to purchase five million or maybe it's vice versa but give you some data to support your decision making so if you do have your insurance policy you know this is like you know i used to say this on employment prices policies but it's almost like you know they give you the free undercoating right and, and people aren't you know they're not using it so use use the use these tools they're available to you and they're and they're free of charge if you're buying the insurance and there's a lot of good stuff out there if you if you bang around on their on their websites and then finally this is something we came up with and within the organization this is again for for March McLean agency policyholders this is a free service but we're calling it the cyber resiliency network and we just launched this on 325 of this year because we were seeing so much demand and so many questions from our clients around, okay, we want to get better. We really want to, uh, you know, we, we want to understand how to make our organization stronger. And we wanted to, uh, we wanted to give them some vetted solutions that we felt confident they could go to. So on this brochure, and we can send this brochure out to you, um, if you're a policyholder, these are all, again, just in, if you're buying cyber, these are tools that you can use and you get like preferred rates. So like uh, TracePoint, Arete, Crow, they're all risk management or pre-breach vendors. So they'll help you kind of, they can do diagnosis of your systems. They can come in and say, hey, here's a good, you know, here's a potential incident response plan. They can do, you know, they'll do a consultation for an hour with your district or whatever and say, okay, here's some things that we would focus on. They might even stoplight. You know, a few of these will stoplight your your risk management tools that are in place, and say, "Okay, this is this is all really good. Here's some things we might want to work on. Here's some things that would really cause me concern. We need to get this addressed right now." Just give you another perspective from an outside resource that can help you protect the organization. And then Mullen Coughlin and McDonald Hopkins are both law firms, and they between the two of them they handle a bulk of the cyber events in the U.S. every year. Um, they're really strong. They're also um, on the panel, their panel council for most of the carriers that we end up working with. So what we've done there is we've kind of, we've given an hour of consultation with them as well. And where I see that helping is when you have an event, and for those of you who've had an event or those of you who had a close call, know that it's a, uh, you're drinking out of a fire hose for that first 48 to 72 hours, if, if not longer, right? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of decisions to be made. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen at times, and some of them aren't such good cooks, and some of them are really good cooks, and it's tough to determine who's, who's giving the right information and who's not. Um, if you, Mullenkopf and McDonald's Hopkins both act as breach coaches, so they have people that have been through a number of cyber events, when, they, when there's an event, they say, hey, here's a good forensic team. These people work well. They understand this, this particular threat actor. They understand who they are. They understand how to react to them. They can, they can help us out there. You know, here's a good uh, Bitcoin company that can help us if we want to pay the ransom. Here's, some, you know, here's a good um, um, restorative team that can come in and make sure our systems are back up to speed and run. So I'm, I'm telling you that because those are the decisions you have to make in that first 24 to 72 hours. 
if you meet with one of these two or both of these in advance of ever having an event and kind of walk through your plan and what you're going to do, you know, you can, it's, you're going to be in a much better spot. And we, we do this all the time where we, you know, we have a, a, an onboarding meeting with these, with these law firms just to kind of understand that relationship and what everybody's roles in and what decisions are going to have to be made. And we find much better results. So we might, you know, instead of having that $250,000 event, we have that $40,000 event. Still not pleasant, still not fun. I, I, I had a Rick, Amy knows this, I had an emergency Rick Canal yesterday afternoon and uh, it actually, it turned out really well. Like somebody said, how'd it go? I'm like, well, I never want to spend a Tuesday afternoon doing that again, but you know, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, right? And I'd say that's kind of like a cyber event, right? If you're prepared for it and they numb it up right, you're going to probably be, you're, you're, you're going to probably be in a lot better spot than if you if you don't have that, uh, that pre-breach um, um, screen or, or review. So I would strongly encourage you to, uh, look at this brochure and then engage with a few of those resources. Again, it'd be no charge to your organization. Um, and I think it could help you out as you're, as you're, uh, as you're moving um, through an event. If you, if you know, fortunately you never have an event, or hopefully you never have an event, but uh, if you do, I think this would really help you out. And I think that's probably another key point that any of the cyber policies, obviously Dan and I are most familiar with those that we've placed through the school board association um, but whoever you are working with on your cyber is going to have a lot of that pre-loss or at the moment you think there is an issue, there should be a great support team that the moment you think that there's a problem, you want to give them a call. Call your broker. So for example, some of you may be calling me. Trust me, I am going to pass that along as fast as I can to the experts. And they're going to get in and really give you the best next steps to figure out, you know, have we really had a cyber attack? Have we had a breach? Because terminology is key here. Um, and get you moving in the right direction with the forensic team, with the PR team, with the legal team. And just supporting your IT team because they are dealing with this every day on where do we need to look for? What do we have to check into? Um, so make sure you guys also understand that because you're going to be the first ones to find it out. Um, and so you just need to know where to go. Dan, and do you want to? Oh, I was going to say, we'll up the questions here too pretty quick. Yeah, I think this is the final slide. I just, this is, this is going to be obvious to everyone on here, but you know, this is still something that we find going into organizations. I think people think cyber is an IT issue, and it's not. It's it's organizational. Um, you know, you, everyone has to be on board. I always tell the story about there was a controller I worked with. She's a manu at a manufacturing company, but she was upset at their IT folks. She was upset at their sales folks, everyone else. And I, you know, we're, as we're talking, she's taking notes. She was right out of central casting, and I looked down and and uh, you know, bun in the hair, nice suit. And she had her password taped to her laptop, you know. And I'm like, well, that's that's you know. And we were talking, and we, you know, well, that's not good either, right? You know, it, we, everybody has a stake in this game. Everybody has to understand that it's an explosion to the organization and all the different levels. You know, um, you know, making sure that people can't get in the school without being monitored. All these different things are are so important to cybersecurity. So, um, if if we can help make an impression there with anybody within your organization. It is not just IT, it's everyone. And uh, we just got to make sure we're working together and it's, it's a partnership. So that I think is the, uh, the final, the final point. So any questions? Yeah, we got time, uh, Amy, for just a couple questions. If people have them, I see Mike Kloon has his hand up. If he still has a question, I'm not sure. Um, no, I guess the question that I ended up having um, was with multi-factor authentication. So we like use smart finance. Um, basically, that's a Citrix client. They log in. They get access to that. It's not something that we have on site, um, but that's not dual factor. They have multiple questions that might get asked. There's like four questions that are specific to them, and then they get asked a random question. That's not considered multi-factor, but realistically, with a third party, how are we able to enable multi-factor in that case? Well, I, I guess I don't know all the services, but did, did they would they offer something that would be more, you know, like, uh, you know, 
we're going to send a text to this number or whatever as well to you know confirm or verify a number or something like that. I, you know, I the, those questions, I get really leery, and of course I'm paranoid as I'll get out around cybersecurity. But I, I you know, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on anything because I don't, you know. But I think about like you know, my wife is on Facebook. Not to pick on my wife because she's a very smart, <laughs> smart person, but. Um, you know, they know our kids, you know, when their birthdays are, they know our dog's names, they know all this stuff that are those typical questions. So I don't like those, that question system. Um, I'd rather have somebody send me a, you know, a text to my phone and say, you know, hey, here's your account and, you know, punch it in and have two different modes of authentication and on two different devices, quite honestly, is what I, what I feel most comfortable with. And when I look at from the authentication standpoint, um, I have users like I have a person right now that she's got a COVID shot yesterday, so she's working from home and she's using a Chromebook. Well, Chromebook, Chromebooks don't have multi-factor authentication unless we're authenticating using Google. And then she's going into her smart program rather than if we had a desktop and she was at the office and we had dual factor authentication set up with an active directory she would log in there and then are we going to have multiple levels of dual factor then for her email, for her smart finance, for student information system. So from an insurance standpoint, how many dual level authentication or dual factors do we have to have for all of these users, especially our administrators, because everything that they use has confidential data. So they're going to have their computer, you know, all of these other programs. How many levels do we need? Yeah. And then that's, the that's a great question. I don't know if I can answer it very well. I would say this kind of goes back to what Amy was saying earlier. It's like the, you know, these applications or even the multi-factor authentication supplements, they they kind of ask yes or no questions, right? And it's not a yes or no answer. Um, so I, you know, I think, you know, that's where at times we find that it's important to get on the phone with the underwriter and say, okay, here's our segregation. Here's what we're doing with this level of person who has access to these type of things. This is how we're, you know, this is how we're controlling this. Um, for our staff out, you know, in the field that has less sensitivity and we, but we've got them segregated, right? Who has less, you know, access to less sensitive data. Here's, you know, here's what we're doing here. And here's, here's kind of our process. Cause you know, like, I think about that, you know, even I was thinking about that as I said that today on today's talk, like multi-factor authentication, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people, right? Um, and, and so in, in not to be, not to tell you completely how we make the sausage, and, but when we go to an underwriter, you know, sometimes you don't want the smartest underwriter in the, in the, in the world, right? You want the underwriter who's, who wants to see somebody check the boxes. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but that's, you know, that's kind of how it, it works sometimes is because if they're not necessarily understanding, they might, they might give us something that maybe they shouldn't really even give us because they don't understand what they're asking and they certainly don't understand what we're telling them. So then, you know, we, we go forward on it, but yeah, no, it's, that's uh, I'm sorry. I'm giving a, a roundabout answer because I don't have a good one, um, but that that's a real challenge um, in, in, in sharing that. And uh, you know, like I I'm just thinking about a, um, a very complex um, financial institution Rex, that I work with, you know, there we have about a three hour phone call every year and we walk through all these different questions, right? And, and you know, go into great detail there. I, you know, it, with, the, with the school district generally, it's, uh, it's more of a general answer. Um, we want to be complete, you know, straightforward on that, but it's more of a general answer that will accomplish our goals. I think one of the advantages that schools do have is because so many of the same systems are unique to schools that there's a large volume of you. So if multiple yeah. districts are going to Skyward, to Smart Finance, just to pick on a, a few of them and saying, hey, we need to have this because you are potentially jeopardizing our cyber coverage or going to cause us to have a large increase, I think they're going to be responsive. And the other thing, I, I mentioned this again, but, and Dan, you correct me if you think I'm, I'm not, I'm speaking out of turn. These are only going to ramp up because the sophistication of the hackers are out there. So like right now, we may not need multiple factor on students, but that's probably gonna come and we're probably gonna have to go up additional levels. So Mike, even the things that you were just describing, another great thing that all of you could do is write out a summary of what you have in place. Because I will tell you when I talk to your business managers, they are wonderful people and they know a lot, but boy, when it comes to some of the IT stuff, that is not their gift. And they will just give me, oh yeah, we have MF or we don't have multi-factor or, well, everybody has to use a password. Okay, well, yeah, I hope so, but there's a whole lot more that you're doing. 
So if you can put some bullet points, that will help us a ton in trying to get the renewal done. And then we can come back to you and say, hey, we got some more questions from the carrier. That's uh, great, great information, Amy and Dan. And I'm, I'm gonna, gonna bring it to a close here uh, so that we can, we, we can move on. But wow, um, I, hope, I think everybody will agree that was um, fabulous information. We couldn't have asked for a better um, you know, overview and concrete ideas. You talked about security awareness training. Um, you talk about having that list when we do risk assessments, that's what we're trying to do is create that list of what is happening, you know, in our district. So we encourage everybody to do that. Um, you talked about uh, incidents response plans, which leads right into what we're going to talk about in the second half uh, of the morning. Um, and that it's not just IT, uh, but that this is an organizational issue. Um, so again, Dan and Amy from Marsh and McKinnon uh, Agency, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for being here this morning uh, and giving us just a wonderful uh, a wonderful set of resources and things to think about uh, as, as we move forward. And I do, do need to also say thanks to Eric Simmons and Mike Kloon at Chisago Lakes for helping us set this up. I know they are clients uh, and work with you uh, as well. So, um, so thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Outstanding, and 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 you're you're welcome to stick around if you know if you if you want as well. Um, so we're going to transition right into um, our next speaker, um, and uh, um, and again we'll get those resources. Amy said she she will share some things with us, and we'll get those uh, posted on our resources area. <clears throat> excuse me as well for everybody. Um, and remember that we did record this session, so if you want to have others in your district. Uh, take a look at it at some point. Um, you are more than you will be more than welcome to do that. Um, but we're going to transition right into our next uh, speaker. And if you know, if if we start to run out of time, um, that's okay uh, because I think this is good information for us to hear, and I don't want to lose any of it. Um, and we can talk. We we can do a large group activity at the end if we don't get to the breakout rooms. Uh, but we'll see. You know, we'll see where this goes. Um, but I want to uh, welcome uh, our next speaker, Ryan Clotier from Security Studio. Security Studio is a partner uh, with ECMEC on, on risk assessments. Um, and Ryan is a seasoned veteran in the cybersecurity area. He's the principal security consultant for Security Studio. Uh, 15 years of experience developing cybersecurity programs uh, for even some Fortune 500 organizations. He's a virtual chief information security officer for K-12 districts around the country and is a certified information system security professional. That's a CISSP, um, proficient in cloud security and just an all around general guru in the world of cybersecurity. So we are pleased as punch to have Ryan join us uh, today. And I think the same thing will, will, will happen um, if you have questions uh, between Nicole and I and John, we'll try to moderate those and, and get those questions in, in front of Ryan if he's uh, not able, he's probably able to see them too as we go along, but we'll make sure that uh, you can ask questions as well. So Ryan, thank you for joining us. I know you've been listening and, and participating in the chat as well, so I bet you'll have some things to add to that discussion we had uh, had so far this morning. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Awesome. So uh, great session by Marsh. You know, they touched on a lot of really important stuff. And before I get into incident response planning, I just want to recap from a security professional perspective some of the things that they said. Um, so the first thing I want to drive home is a really important point. You heard them mention that, you know, this year probably most likely not needing MFA on a student system. I'm going to go ahead and tell you the districts I work with have all received increases, every single one of them. Uh, everything is going to be in scope. Uh, the industry, the insurance industry had a very hard market this year. Uh, they paid out much, much more than they ever anticipated to. And somebody somewhere counting beans is going to want to fix that. So I assure you with a high degree of confidence, prepare for more strict requirements from your underwriters, from your insurance company. And one of those is going to be multi-factor. Now, when it comes to multi-factor authentication, uh, I agree with Dan, it does get broader than just technology, but what you can do to start is start with the technology. 
And there are solutions in the market today that will allow you to have a single MFA for all of your systems. So you will integrate a solution like, for example, Duo or Microsoft's Azure if you're an Active Directory shop. Uh, you can use Microsoft's Azure Active Directory MFA. There's several other solutions in the market. But basically what you do is you point those multi-factor solutions to the apps you have. Even if those apps don't natively support multi-factor, this is an important distinction to make. You have today systems, learning systems in the environment that probably don't have native multi-factor capability. But if you use a solution uh, for multi-factor, you can add that capability to those apps. So I really encourage you to explore looking at using an MFA solution. The other thing that's going to do for you is it's going to make the friction with your users less. Nobody wants to have to sit and log in and log in and log in again. And as a security professional who has multiple layers on systems, I can assure you, while I love security, it can be annoying at times. So we want to make it as friction free as possible for our users. Uh, and you can do that using an MFA solution. So I just, I really want to drive home that point because it is such an important part of what we need to do going forward through 2021 into 2022. The other point I want to make is um, the hackers are actually becoming less sophisticated, not more. The majority of breaches that happened this year were not a result of sophisticated attacks, contrary to what the lawyers and PR people want you to believe. These were simple attacks that were easy to stop. No company wants to hit the news and say, we got uh, hacked or uh, our data was breached because we failed to do some basic things. That's not the story they're gonna tell. They're gonna say, oh my God, the most sophisticated hackers in the world took us down using novel techniques. I've been in this game a long time. I have very rarely ever seen novel techniques used to take down somebody. It's almost always a machine that wasn't patched, a phishing email, uh, a third party that wasn't properly managed. I would say over 87% of attacks are the direct result of something simple that your third party didn't do. Now, having said that, the reason I say hackers, and I use that term really to describe cyber criminals, hackers are just curious people, uh, but cyber criminals don't have to be as sophisticated because the tooling has become easier to use. When I started doing this years ago, you actually had to know how a computer worked intimately. You had to understand the processor and the memory and how applications worked, how networks worked. And so you, you, you were required to have this vast amount of knowledge to successfully compromise a machine. Today, your students can watch five minutes of YouTube and take down your network. So that's what you're actually protecting against. And that's why it's so important to have a good plan. So with that, I'm going to segue us to what we're going to talk about today, which is incident response planning. Ryan, Ryan can I, sorry, can I just interrupt with one question quick that I thought was maybe a good Absolutely. one related to what you were talking about. And it was, uh, should, should we be concerned with using a third party for MFA, even though it gives another layer of security, does it add another layer of possible compromise? What are your thoughts about that? Yep. So uh, this comes down to risk and balancing that risk. If you use a third party MFA, but you have an appropriate set of security controls on both ends of that relationship, your risk is very minimal. And I would say that you should treat your third party MFA company with the same degree of scrutiny and require them to meet the same standards as you do your financial services provider. Everybody should be held to a standard. And, and ECMAC being a partner of Security Studio actually has access to a uh, vendor risk assessment platform that we provide that will help you make those determinations about how risky a vendor is. Uh, the other nice thing, and I didn't mean for this to be a sales pitch, so I'll, I'll end it right here, but the other nice thing is that it will tell you specifically and the vendor specifically what they need to fix. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that and leverage that uh, because this can be very daunting and tedious work and the tool just makes it so much easier. Now. When it comes to incident response planning, I'm going to go back to something Dan said about paper. Paper is your best friend. Multiple copies of paper 
are your best friend. All too often, we see people that build these amazing disaster recovery plans and incident response plans, and they've got all the diagrams and documents and call trees in an Excel sheet on their local hard drive. That machine gets ransomed, and oops, we don't know what to do. So I encourage you to have multiple copies of this. For security reasons, you may actually not want to keep some of these plans on the network. Because if you are compromised, the bad guys will go and try to find those plans so that they can stay a step ahead of you. So believe it or not, a good old fashioned three ring binder stored in several buildings is your best bet. Um, you know, planning is, is so critical to what we do every day, right? We, we plan for curriculum. We plan for, uh, just think of this last year. How much planning went into this last year? How are we going to do remote learning? How do we deal with contact tracing? How do we do these things? How are we going to sanitize devices when they come back for service? We had to come up with plans for all that. This is no different, and it should not be treated different. The same teams you worked with to develop those plans should be involved in incident response planning. This is not an IT exercise. This is a safety and preparedness exercise. So uh, just real quick, Security Studio, who the heck are we? Uh, we're some really passionate, crazy security folks with this mission to make the world a better place. Uh, we do that by being values-based, mission-focused, and vision-driven. So everything we do, we do not uh, for the bottom line, but for the betterment of the world. It's why we're so passionate about schools. It's why we make so many resources available at either low cost or no cost. So with that, what is an incident response? Well, according to the IT dictionary, uh, an incident response is an organized approach to addressing a cyber attack or a security event, security breach, a computer incident. We have all these interchangeable names for uh, what an incident response would be. Now, one distinction I wanna make is breach is a special word. So unless you are the district's counsel, that word should never come out of your mouth. That is a legal term that has ramifications. So we let the lawyer decide if we've had a breach. We have had security incidences, security events. You know, we're investigating a potential. That's our language. We leave the word breach to lawyers because, again, legal ramifications. Um, but essentially, it's having a good plan for what we're going to do. What the heck are we going to do when the teacher comes running into our tech office with their hair on fire saying, my God, my God, I clicked the link and my whole screen went red and now it's talking about Bitcoin. So this is having that plan. Uh, I'll get into a little bit about planning for staff events versus student events because we may want to handle them differently versus outside events. Um, depending on the nature of the event, we may or may not choose to involve law enforcement or we may choose to involve them at a certain time. Generally, what I found in schools is if it involves a student, we want to be a little bit slow to get the law enforcement involved. This may be a curious kid that just made a mistake or perhaps they were, they were uh, on a spectrum somewhere so they didn't fully understand the consequence of their action and maybe throwing the book at them in the FBI isn't the correct answer. Your district will have to decide how best to handle those situations and you most likely have some guidance around that today for other types of events. So with any plan, believe it or not, the first step is planning. You have to plan to have a plan. Now, this isn't meeting to have a meeting. Those are always fun, having a meeting about a meeting. But this is having a plan about a plan. So it, it, it really comes down to preparation. Do I know the roles and responsibilities in my organization? Do I know who's on what base? So for example, communications is an important part of incident response. Do I know who that human being is in my district, the communications lead? Do I know who my community, community liaison is? Do I know who is in charge of curriculum? Do I know who's in charge of the network, the applications, my third parties? Do I know who to call at, the, at those third parties that I work with? Do I have their phone numbers and names and emails? So that's what we do in our preparation phase. And I'll go into more of the details uh, as we go. The next step is identification. So this literally is the what's, the who's, the where's. Uh, and if you're doing a really thorough job, the why's. Uh, the next phase of an incident response plan is containment. So this is the control phase. This is where we're trying to get our arms around the situation that's happened. We're attempting to cut off any further spread. Uh, for example, if we have a ransomware event, this is us attempting to stop that ransomware from spreading further into the network. 
Uh, and that's what we're doing in containment. Eradication is the how phase. How am I getting rid of this? What variant of ransomware is it? Are there publicly available decryption keys? Uh, am I able to restore from backup? How am I going to get this out of my system? Then there's the recovery phase, which is the cleanup. Okay, great. I had a disaster of some sort. Now I'm cleaning up from it. I'm, I'm restoring things back to normal operation. Uh, perhaps I am, uh, you know, getting rid of local admin, implementing MFA, changing the domain admin password from domain admin password to something more secure. Um, you know, really going through that recovery process. And then lastly, think of it as like the recycling symbol. It's lessons learned. What did I learn from this event that I can apply back to step one for better planning so that I'm better prepared for the next time this happens? And unfortunately, as you heard, cyber events are not going to decrease. They will only increase in frequency and severity in the next coming years. Uh, you may have heard in the news, there's a country uh, called China that's not really a fan of ours. Uh, they may have partnered with another country called Russia, and we may be living in a cyber war where, unfortunately, school districts are being victimized by both criminals and nation states looking to use your computing resources to execute their espionage. Believe it or not, schools are very soft targets for cyber criminals and nation states, and both of them like to use your resources to conduct either crime or spycraft. So we want to make that as hard of a job as possible for them. So we want to apply those lessons learned. So let's talk about step one. How do we prepare to build an incident response plan? And the first step is to actually form the team. It's to get the humans involved before we put pen to paper. Now, a good IR team should include a stakeholder from each respective group in the district. I like to see one stakeholder from the business office. I like to see a stakeholder from curriculum, buildings and grounds, maintenance. I like to see one from transportation. I like to see one from communications. Uh, depending on how large your district is, some of these humans may wear more than one hat. But I like them all to be at the table, up to and including someone from the school board. This is a complete IR team. The reason we want to have that team built before we design our plans is that we're going to need the support and participation of each one of those individuals or their teams. And because we need their participation, I have found in my experience of doing this job, the earlier I involve folks in the conversation, the easier it becomes to get the support from them needed. Okay? It's a really important part here because this isn't about data, believe it or not. Information security isn't about information or security. It's about protecting human beings. It's about protecting students. If no one got hurt when the data got stolen, we wouldn't have a job to do. So it's very important to understand that, that we are, we are doing this specifically to promote safety. Yes, it comes in the form of computing and protecting data, but we're protecting that data to protect safety. So once we have our humans figured out, our roles and our responsibilities, we move into knowing what we have in our environment. And Dan touched on this earlier. It is amazing to me how many large scale organizations, multi-billion dollar companies don't know what they have. So when you're sitting there thinking to yourself, man, I don't really have an asset library. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure of every single thing on the network or all the cloud services or third parties you might be using. Don't feel bad about this. You're not alone. This is unfortunately very common. However, those districts that have a complete inventory uh, are less likely to have catastrophic level events because having that knowledge of what is where, what I have, where I have it, what it's doing and why allows me then to detect when something weird is happening, which allows me to respond sooner and reduces the likelihood that that infection spreads or that that attack continues. So if we think in the terms of DDoS, uh, you know, knowing which, which uh, network segments are affected and being able to sinkhole that traffic, or if we think in the terms of ransomware, knowing you know, where that is and what's, what network segment that system might be connected to, I might be able to just turn off that network segment and leave the rest of the district operational and cut off the spread of the ransomware. 
So it's super important to know what you have. And I, I'm going to go a step further here. What you have also applies to data. Now, that's a more mature thing to do. So if you're just getting started, don't worry about data. Focus on critical assets. Critical assets I define as something that the absence of would result in a stop in learning. So if you didn't have it, the business of school comes to a stop. Those things are your critical assets. Generally, we think of them as our directory services. Uh, if we're in a remote learning capacity, it could be our Google Meets or our Zoom. Uh, but whatever that technology is, if it was to be unavailable and it would cause learning to stop or make learning incredibly difficult or the business of school incredibly difficult, that's a critical asset. So think payroll, HR, student information system. These are the types of things. And even if it's managed by a third party in the cloud, that's still your responsibility. You need to hold that vendor accountable. You need to have that inventoried. Just because somebody else runs it and you pay a subscription fee does not prevent you from needing to track it, manage it, and secure it. The next thing you want to have is an appropriate level of security policy. And ECMEC has some wonderful policies for you. And uh, we provide policy templates as well. I think ECMEC might even be using some of those. Um, have the right level of security policy. The most successful districts that I've seen have a board level policy that says the superintendent delegates the authority to decide security policy to the tech director. So you have one single board policy that does not need to be revisited as the information security policies might change and rotate throughout even the course of a year. You don't have to go back to the board to get them reapproved. So that policy that says I delegate that authority is the one the board needs. And then specifically, the technical team needs to have those more granular policies about remote access and, and uh, you know, part of the acceptable use agreement, uh, encryption, all those various technical Things. The next Ryan, page. Can I ask you a question about that? So do you yep. find that those are still called policies that the tech group creates or are they being called something different? Because we've struggled with that a lot. Yeah, so policy in, in the school world is such a firmly understood word to mean a board policy. So I have seen districts call them procedures. I have seen districts call them playbooks. I have seen districts call them procedures you know, different things, at the end of the day, the industry calls them policies. So if you're talking to a cyber professional, they're going to ask about policy. If you're talking to an insurance carrier, they're going to ask about policy. So I do encourage you to put the word information security in front of it. And by putting the words information security in front of the word policy, we now know this has nothing to do with school board. This truly is a technological policy. Um, but again, if you find that using that word is preventing you from having effective conversations, crumple it up and throw it away. Call it whatever you want. Call it the, the magic paper that's going to save our keister when we have something bad happen. Whatever you need to do to effectively communicate is what I encourage you to do. And to that point, the next bullet point is to be prepared to communicate. All too often, we have not taken enough time to plan our responses. And now somebody from the media shoving a microphone in our face demanding some answers. Or we've got parents on Facebook creating a, a, a storm of nonsense as they're flinging all kinds of terrible comments around about all of this and that. And we've seen that. I, I've watched more districts spend more time dealing with parents on social media than they have teaching kids how to learn. So the better and tighter that communication is, the more pre-planned and pre-canned, the better off you're going to be. And the next piece... To, to preparing is you have to practice this stuff. Every plan is the greatest plan in the world until you go to use it. And that's when you find out, oops, that part wasn't so good. This part's unnecessary. We spent too little time here and too much time here. So practice it on paper. It doesn't have to be hard, by the way. You can do an incident response tabletop uh, in about two and a half hours just on paper. It's well worth the investment of your time to make sure your plan actually works. So let's talk about how do we identify. Let's get a little deeper in the weeds now. So when I'm in an incident response plan, some of the things I need to know when I'm identifying is when did this event happen? 
So it's important for me to build into my plan a step where I investigate when did it happen? Uh, you heard some stats earlier about kind of the timeline. We used to have this rule that was called uh, three, three, five, 16. Three minutes to detect it, five minutes to find it, 16 minutes to fix it. We're now down to one, three, five. One minute to find it, three minutes to, to investigate it, and five minutes to fix it. We expect that number to drop even further. We expect identification to start to move into the sub 30 second category. So knowing when it happened is important. Traditionally, what we have found is if, uh, if a district is not practicing security uh, formally, uh, a lot of times the breach will, when it's detected, will have been a year past when the event actually occurred. So now you have a year's worth of investigation. What happened during that year? How much data was taken during that year? That's a, that's a very lengthy and expensive investigation. If you can narrow that window, uh, you save a lot of money and time. So when did it happen is an important part of your plan. How was it discovered? Who discovered it? How did you become aware of this? Was this an email from a staff member? Did someone like myself send you an email saying, hi, I found your data on the dark net? Right? How did you become aware uh, that this happened and, and how was it discovered? Who discovered it? Uh, this is very important uh, because again, we might need to talk to that human and say, so what happened prior to the pop-up on your screen? Well, you see, I was on Facebook and I took a survey to find out what my spirit animal was and then my screen changed. So we want to talk to who, uh, you know, who discovered it and have that conversation with that human. Uh, and believe it or not, that's actually a real story. That's a real event. I had a situation where, where it turned out that, that doing a survey for spirit animals <laughs> resulted in some, some, mal some malware. So don't do that. Uh, if you don't know your favorite color, Facebook is not the place to figure it out. Go to the store and get a box of crayons. Um, you want to look at if other areas have been impacted. So a lot of times we will see the attack on a single machine but in reality, this is happening on multiple machines or it's, it's uh, uh, other areas of our environment. I had a, I had a district that uh, the admin's laptop got hit with uh, malware. It was some, some adware malware. So it wasn't ransomware, but it wasn't good. And the actual attack was against the building control systems. So the malware then pivoted because what they were really after was messing with the HVAC stuff and the operational technology. So you need to be very aware if there's other areas. Sometimes just like when we get uh, physically ill in life, our symptoms might look like one thing, but when we go to the doctor, we find out it's something else. So the same is true in the computer world. Symptoms could indicate, hey, it seems to be this laptop, but we want to look everywhere else to see if we uh, notice other indicators. And that segues us to the next piece. What is the scope? So in our plan, we need to have steps to discover this. We need to say, okay, step one of, of an event is asking these questions. What happened? Where did it happen? Who discovered it? What's impacted? How big is this? Is this whole district? Is this one building? Is this one VLAN? Is this just one machine? Uh, is it affecting, you know, is it the district office and it's affecting 10 buildings? The next question is, is, does it affect operations? Just because I'm dealing with a security event or incident doesn't necessarily mean my operations have been impacted. And we always must prioritize safety first, learning second, convenience third. So when we're looking at that, we say to ourselves, okay, does it affect operations? The first thing I always want, to ask, want you to ask yourself in a security event is, does this impact health, life, and safety? Now we're all here in Minnesota and thankfully the terrible tundra of the winter has left us. However, it will come back. They've assured me it will come back again. We have furnaces and boilers and heating systems in our buildings today that are electronically controlled. There's not a guy in the, in the deal with a shovel pushing coal into a furnace, at least I hope not. And if your district still does it that way, you might want to talk to your, your city about a bond for some better heating. But that has to be asked is this does this potentially affect that because if it's 20 degrees below zero outside and we lose the ability to heat a building we have to send students home that's a that's a health life and safety event uh maybe it affects the payroll system that's really scary but if it's not on payday i might have a little bit of time to deal with this 
If it's on payday, I have no time to deal with this. This is the most important thing. So does it affect operations? And if so, how much does it affect them? Do we have some workarounds? Can we continue forward? And this gets into a different kind of plan you need that I won't go into today, but you'll hear me mention a couple times, which is a learning continuity plan. And if you've never heard this term before, it's because it was recently invented by me and some friends because business continuity plan just doesn't fit schools. So it's a learning continuity plan. And if you go to the Amazon, a good friend of mine actually wrote a book on this. It's 10 bucks. Get it. It's everything you need to know, step-by-step -step guide on how to build a learning continuity plan for your district. Um, the next thing you want to look at is, do I know where this came from? Do I know the point of entry? How did this get into my environment? Did a student plug a thumb drive into a media computer? Did a staff member uh, upload an infected attachment to our Google Drive? Did someone click a link? Uh, how did it get in? And this is very important because if I don't know how it got in, I can't be sure that I've closed the door to keep it out. So I need to know how it got in. What was the source of the event? Any questions on this so far? I know I'm talking fast and covering a lot. Ryan, not to go backwards, but we did have a question about multi-factor. So sure. what are your thoughts on the, um, the excuse that I don't want to use my personal device for multi-factor for the school district because they don't pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have people who use like the, because we have like these YubiKeys that we've mm -hmm. been playing do you have people that use that? Is that a good solution? Absolutely. So here, here's what I found. In my uh, I had a district recently implement multi-factor for the entire district, for all staff, mandatory, all systems. And immediately the pushback was, I don't want to use my personal device. So we said, do you check your Gmail, your district Gmail from your personal device? Yes, I do. Well, then you need to stop doing that. Well, I don't want to. Well, then we don't see the challenge here in you putting an app because we can't access your phone. We can't access your data. You're just installing an authenticator app that you and you alone have access to. But if you're really concerned about that, do not use your personal device for any district activity. And what we found was there was actually only one human out of 650 humans who really didn't use their phone at all whatsoever. And for that human, we gave them a UV key. And we gave them the first one for free and we made them sign a piece of paper that said if they lost it, the replacement cost was $300 because you got to pay for the key and the time. And magically, let me tell you, the most prized possession on their keychain is that UV key. They'll lose their house key before they lose a UV key. So that's how you deal with that one. You, but you know, have a real conversation because a lot of this is based on a misunderstanding of how the technology works and they're concerned if they put the app on the phone, the district's going to be spying on their web browsing habits and maybe they're not doing the safest web browsing and they don't want someone to know that. Um, just take some time to talk to them. You will find the majority of your staff are already using personal devices for district purposes today. You will find the majority of your staff uh, when they're when you take time to have a real conversation, go, oh, okay, that's how it works. You mean you can't just read my text messages? No, I can't read your text messages. Oh, okay, then it's no big deal. The other thing is, is ask them if they already have an authenticator app because a lot of times they will already have one for a different site or the bank or something like that. And we can just add our key into that app. So they don't even have to install anything at that point. They just scan a QR code that pops up on the screen and they're good to go. So that's what I encourage you to do when it, when it comes to MFA is have that conversation. And then for those that are highly resistant, you know, go down the UV key route, but put the paperwork in place that makes, makes it so that they, they don't lose it. Because if you don't do that, I promise every three days they're going to be in your office. The dog ate my UV key again. The kid took it with the homework and then gave it to somebody else, you know, <laughs> or whatever, whatever the terrible excuse will be. So back to identification for a second. This is how we're going to make this practical. So do I think you need to go through manually everything in the district across the network? Oh, gosh, no. That's going to take you two and a half, three years. Use some tools. There's lots of free tools. And uh, um, my favorite is Snipe IT. Uh, it's one I like a lot. It's really robust and it's free. Um, but it will help you discover what you have. And if you do this, you will discover at least one thing. 
at least one thing you didn't know you had. Uh, my favorite story about this is I was working with a district and we did a network assessment. And I said, what's that network segment? And everybody looked at me and said, I don't know. I said, well, there's you know 50 computers on it, you know, and a lot of traffic. What is it? No one knew. So we chased it down. Well, lo and behold, what we found is that the library was getting its internet from the district's core and the library was then supplying that internet to the fire station. And so now here we had a critical piece of infrastructure for the community sitting on a network segment managed by the district and they didn't even know it. So it's important to know what you have. You will be shocked to find. The other one is, and this is another fun one, working with the district here in Minnesota, who I won't name, we discovered a student had left a device behind. So a student had taken a Raspberry Pi, tucked it up in the ceiling, and went about their business. We found that device by doing network scanning. Uh, the student was using that device to remote in in the middle of the night and use the district bandwidth to download a bunch of content from the internet. Turns out that uh, that gigabyte, uh, that 10 gig pipe you have when no one's using it in the middle of the night, really good for downloading stuff from the internet. So check uh, and use tools to assist with it. When someone comes to you to report an issue, again, back to my, my example about spirit animals, have an interview, talk to them. What happened in the preceding minutes, hours, days? You know, Have you been to any new websites? Have you tried out any new curriculum software? Uh, has anyone new emailed you recently? Did you make a new contact on social media recently? Talk to them, learn. They will a lot of times reveal what happened without even knowing they're revealing it. They'll say, well, yeah, I, you know, so-and-so hit me up and I made this LinkedIn connection and they sent me this great PDF. And look at this thing, it's so cool. Well, that PDF is, is made with, uh, you know, malware. So yeah, it looks like the thing that you wanted, but behind the scenes is malware. Um, you know, Mary Messacomer brings up a, a very important point that I don't have a bullet on, which is there, you cannot shame. This is not a shame thing. If you shame people, if you make them feel bad, they're never going to come to you. What you want to do is create a positive culture of safety. We all make mistakes. It happens. I just had unemployment fraud done on me. And I have about 9,000 steps you got to go through to steal my identity. And it still happened to me. So it can happen to you and it will happen to you and it will happen to them because we're all humans doing the best we can with this crazy world we live in. So promote positive culture. Uh, and I'll, I'll just talk about that for one more second. The districts that run an incentivized program for reporting are the ones that are least likely to have an attack. A king size candy bar has never in my, I just am blown away by this. A king size candy bar will motivate most adults to do incredible things. And I, I don't, I just don't get it. They're like, what, $3 now you can buy one. But if you, if you offer one and the way we do it is we create an incentive program that says the person that reports the most amount of fishing or suspicious, suspicious activity in the month wins a king size candy bar. My gosh, my inbox lights up like crazy. So use that kind of incentive. Do a pizza party for the, for the grade level that has the highest reporting of fishing. Whatever that looks like, but create a positive incentivized program. Uh, it will help you in ways that, that all the technology in the world can't. The next thing is to document your findings. So as you're talking to these folks, as you're doing these interviews, as you're collecting this information, it's incredibly important to document it thoroughly, including the date and time that things are happening or things were said or that the, the person reporting said things happened. It's very important for forensic reasons. It also uh, cuts down the amount of time and dollars you'll spend in investigating. Start looking for correlations in those findings. Um, you know, the, the example I'll use here is, you know, uh, third grade English teacher comes running in, says, uh, I just got ransom, you know, I saw some ransomware on my machine. Uh, five minutes later, another teacher comes in, says, hey, I've now also got ransomware. Uh, five minutes after that, another one. Well, it's all in the same building. I haven't heard anything from the other buildings yet. So now I'm saying, hey, wait a second. I can correlate this. It looks like it might be localized to this building. It might be just this group of folks. Uh, so correlating the findings is important. Also, if there's a shared activity, maybe they all three are using the same website. Um, websites can get compromised, legitimate ones. So you could be at a legitimate learning website, 
doing legitimate activity, but that website had been compromised by a bad guy, so now it's running illegitimate code in addition to the legitimate code. So it's important to correlate that so you can start to build a picture. Uh, you want to review your network logs, system logs, logging. If you're not doing logging today or if your logs are not six months or more, reach out. Let's have a chat about that. You need to be logging at six-month increments. Um, all too often, we will go in, and we see this even in the private sector. We go in, we say, okay, we need the logs to reconstruct what happened, and they say, here's last week's logs. Well, that doesn't do us any good when the bad guy got in and got out two months ago. So log for six months up to a year. Uh, I know it's a tall ask. The one caveat I'll give you, please make sure you have appropriate disk space before you turn on logging. A little lesson from my early life. I was very gun ho to get some logging in place. And I said, oh, we're going to log everything. This is going to be great. And we're going to have all the telemetry. And I turned on logging. And about 10 minutes later, a very angry sysadmin was standing at my desk saying, I don't know what you did, but you killed the server. So make sure you have appropriate disk space to hold these logs. And if, and if you're on like a network switch with a limited capacity, roll those logs off to a, a secondary storage uh, so that you can maintain that six month window. You also want to look at your identity and access logs uh, also from your third parties. Now there's some interesting services out there that help you with third party management. And if you want to know anything about that, hit me up offline. I'm happy to put you in touch with those folks. Uh, but you want to make sure you can track the activities of every coming and going of a human on your network. And if you're not able to do that today, that's a great place to start. Track the comings and goings of the who's. Uh, all too often, we treat our third parties like employees and just give them Active Directory accounts. That's not the best practice. Um, you know, We need to know, though, who's coming and who's going and why. And if you do have a third party and they want you to set up an account that says you know, admin at thirdparty.com, say, no, sir or ma'am, we cannot do that. We need a named human being that works there and you need to verify their employment. And about every six months, I'm gonna ask you, do they still work there? Don't use generic named accounts. That will make for a nightmare when you're investigating. Again, try to find the point of entry. It's very important. Uh, and then communication is so critical. Communication coordination should begin the minute you suspect you have something going on. Uh, don't wait to get communications involved until you're sure you know what's going on. Get them involved early. You may need them for things like talking to the insurance company, talking to the lawyers, talking to law enforcement, talking to the board. Uh, I never recommend IT folk in the middle of dealing with an incident do the talking. Let the communication person do the talking and then let the leadership and the lawyers decide what gets said externally. Uh, I had an issue with a, a district in a different state where they, uh, the, they had got a teacher had gotten ransomware and the teacher then took a picture of that ransomware and tweeted it out. That is not a good way to manage communication. Uh, that will just create a mess. So making sure folks know, that's the other part of this communication piece. Make sure your staff knows if there's a security event, you come report it to us. You do not put it on social media. You do not email your colleagues about it. You do not run up and down the hallway screaming, we've been hacked, we've been hacked. It's not a good idea. Um, the minute you don't feel comfortable dealing with this, call in professionals for help. The analogy I'm gonna give you is it's akin to plumbing. Uh, most of us are very comfortable unclogging a sink drain or unclogging our toilet. Very few of us would feel comfortable digging up the front yard and replacing a sewer line. When you're getting into a cyber event, if it becomes too heavy to handle, reach out for help. I have seen too many districts try their best and they, they hit that magic wall. Instead of calling for help, they kept going and they only made the situation worse. So make sure that you are reaching out for help. Contain. Any questions before I get into this? Uh, there is one, Ryan, in the chat um, from Chris Lee. It says, named accounts, how likely is that with service providers with rotation or high turnover, like HVAC, uh, printer management, et cetera? So there are, there, there are a couple of rare exceptions where working very closely with the vendor, I will allow for a group that contains no more than five named humans 
to exist, but they have to send that to me. Then, then, then I set up a group, but then there's a piece of paper. Every time somebody comes in or out of that group, I get an updated document from that vendor. These employees are in this group. These employees are no longer in this group. So that's how I handle that. So that when I'm talking to the lawyer and they say, what happened? Who did it? I say, these five people, <laughs> it was them. That's where this came from. So make sure that you have that paperwork in play. Uh, is this helpful so far? Are you guys learning something? All right. So how do we contain? Okay, so part of our containment plan is knowing how to isolate our systems. And part of why you don't see me being really prescriptive right now is each one of you have a different environment. And your plan needs to fit your environment. That's why I'm not giving you the specifics on how to deal with a Skyward versus a power school or how to deal with a, a Google versus a, an Office 365. That's something you're going to have to do as you go through your planning. Uh, and if you need help with your planning, you know, reach out. We, we can help get you in touch with consultants that can assist in this and, and help you to do this. Uh, I can also put you in touch with some other districts that I've worked with where we have actually developed up some pretty mature plans and they're very... Uh, willing to share with you those templates uh, so that you can can build yours. Um, so now when we're in containment, we want to try to isolate the affected systems. Now, it's very important to understand isolation does not mean power off. In the old days, we would tell you to shut the computer off. Today, we do not tell you that. The reason we don't want you to turn off the computer is a lot of times the evidence we need to figure out what's going on lives in memory and memory only. And if you turn off that computer, that volatile memory, poof, it's gone. We do want you to take it off the network. Good old fashioned, yank out the LAN cable. Uh, if you can't do that because it's on the wireless or something like that, then go into your wireless access controller and, and block that device. Terminate its ability to communicate with the network. Uh, and that is what is quarantining, right? We're quarantining this. We're moving it off the network. We're getting it to an isolated state. We want to try to keep it powered up if we can because it's very helpful for forensics and investigations. But we want to quarantine it to prevent it from spreading its infection. So think of this like COVID. How do we deal with COVID? You test positive, what do we do? We quarantine. Hey, separate you from the group. You go sit over there for a couple of weeks and catch up on your Netflix. Okay, same thing with the computer. We want to quarantine it. Uh, if we can, we want to terminate any access to sensitive data. Where this gets a little challenging is if that sensitive data resides on the local hard drive of that machine. Um, but if, if, for example, that machine has access to the cloud, again, if we take it off the network, it should terminate that access. Uh, but some people are working from home and I kick them off the VPN, but they still have a home internet connection that allows them to navigate to their Google Drive. So once we've identified the system and we know the who, back to the beginning, your who's, your what's, your where's, and your why's, uh, we can then disable that account for that human, thus terminating our access to sensitive data. And again, this isn't being done as punitive to that person, it's to protect the data because at that point, most likely their account is not being used by them, it's being used by a criminal. Uh, we want to try to identify what is this? Is it a worm? Is it a virus? Is it credential stuffing? Uh, is it you know bad passwords being reused? And what what is the nature and type of the event that we're trying to contain? And that's very important to understand because it will affect the different strategies that we use. How how we would go about containing ransomware is not the same as how we go about containing uh, hijack credentials. It's not the same as we go about containing a worm or a virus. So knowing the specifics is very important. Uh, you will hear this a lot, restrict remote access. Now, I know this is hard. It's hard. We're all, I can see you all. You, some of you are at work and some of you are at home. Um, it's about restricting that remote access during the containment phase. This can and will be disruptive to the affected parties, hence why communication is so important. You need to let them know, hey, I'm, this is happening and we need to work with you. You want to cut off as much remote access as possible. I will also tell you that if you believe this is a larger scale event, that this isn't just a couple of computers or one building, this is, you know, this could be district wide, it may make sense at that time to just disable all remote access. You do this because again, you're trying to contain and remote access is, is the number one way that the criminal is getting in and out of your system. So by terminating that, 
you reduce the likelihood that that criminal can continue to interact with your system while you're trying to, to uh, contain it. The next thing to do is patch and update. Oh my gosh, patch and update, patch and update, patch and update. And I know the last couple of months have been a nightmare as every vendor under the sun seems to be pushing out four security patches a day every day. But you've got to do that, especially during containment, because most likely the cause of your event is a vulnerability that has not yet been mitigated. So it's the, the code is out there on the Internet for the bad guys to get. You haven't applied the patch yet because maybe it came out five hours ago or maybe it came out five months ago. It depends on how good you are at patching. Um, but you need to get it updated to the current level and then until you're 100% sure this thing's out of your environment, block all network access for any affected system until you're 100% sure that you're, you're in the clear. Again, any of this feels heavy, reach out for help. Don't try to fight and slog your way through it. It's not worth it. If you have insurance coverage, it may require you to call for help the minute you think you have an event. So it's important to understand, and I was a little surprised not to hear Marsh touch on this, there are requirements in your policy, most certainly about when you tell them, how you tell them, and what steps you need to take if they're going to be the ones cutting checks. So make sure you are intimately familiar with your incident response process from an insurance perspective. They may want to bring in their own staff. A lot of them have uh, contracts with security firms, and they will only pay if you use the firms they tell you. Now, the nice thing is, is most of them will consider using your firm of choice if your firm of choice is, is high quality and, and meets their standards. I have several districts that love to work with FR Secure. It's who they want to work with. They don't want to work with anybody else. And so we have worked with their insurance companies to ensure that FR Secure is an approved vendor. But if you haven't gone through that exercise, you might be in love with your, with your IT group security people you're working with today only to find out you can't actually work with them during your crisis because your insurance company has not approved them. So make sure you do that. Uh, containment. So here's the questions you have to answer. What's been done in the short term to contain this? Somebody wants this answer. Most likely it's a board member or superintendent or lawyer or insurance company. What have you done in the long term to contain this to ensure that, you know, as we continue to clean up and do the other activities, that this isn't going to continue to, to spread and infect things. Uh, have you quarantined it yet? Do you require true multi-factor authentication? So for remote access, true multi-factor means a second physical factor. If you receive an email on the same machine you're logging in from, that is not true multi-factor. We call it multi-factor, but the reality is it isn't because, again, the criminal could very easily intercept that email and now they have your multi-factor token. So for remote access, I really encourage you strongly to use a physical device of some sort. Uh, as you're doing containment, this is the time now to go back and look at all your credentials. Have you reviewed all the credentials for legitimacy and have you hardened them? All too often, we find people that have permission to things they no longer need. We find people with permissions greater than they need to do their job. Uh, we, have, we have seen that so many times. So we want to re-look at those credentials. Do they really need the access levels that they have? And part of why you're doing this is one of the techniques the bad guys use is they will do what's called privilege or permission escalation. So this is where they get a, an account that doesn't necessarily have admin, but by working the system, you know, there's many tactics they'll use to do it, but they essentially elevate the permission level of that account now to have those administrative privileges. So you're looking for that. You're looking to see, you know, should, should Ryan have admin? No, Ryan should never have admin. So if you ever see Ryan with admin, take it away. I shouldn't have it. I don't need it to do my job. So look at that stuff. Uh, and then again, confirm that you have applied all the patches. Okay, any questions there? All right, recovery. All right, so recovery. Uh, one thing I want to drive home as a point for anyone concerned about ransomware, make an air gap backup. I don't care if you go to Micro Center and get thumb drives or you get a removable hard drive, burn it to disk. If you still have tape, congratulations, it's back in vogue. So use it. 
Get it off the network. It is the number one thing you can do to defend against ransomware. And it is the only way to make a backup ransomware proof is to have it off the network. You may hear vendors sell you solutions such as immutable backups. Immutable backups are not ransomware proof. They are uneditable. They're great for forensics and tracking forensic things. They are not uh, ransomware proof because you can overwrite the whole file, which is how ransomware works. So while you can't make changes to the file from a individual line perspective, you can overwrite the whole darn thing with an encrypted file. So immutable backup is not ransomware proof. Don't believe the marketing hype. Air gap backup is the only ransomware proof type of backup. And it's ransomware proof because it's completely off the network, physically disconnected. There's no way for the bad guy to get to it. Uh, during recovery, again, patch and harden your systems. You're noticing some themes here. These are the things that you need to do the most. If you, if you, you know, I'd like to see you do all of these things, but if you were only to do a few of these things, patch, patch, patch. It's so important. Uh, when we say harden, what we're referring to is configuration hardening. We call it security hardening of the configuration. So earlier in the chat, I had made mention about solar winds. Solar winds, while it is a very unfortunate cyber attack, let me be very clear. The companies that had it configured correctly were not affected. It was the companies that allowed it to have internet access it did not need that wound up getting breached. The companies that were using the Orion tool in a securely configured manner were unaffected. So I'm stressing that point because uh, the, the stories in the news don't quite match the truth. The truth is secure configuration matters. So when I say harden a system, I'm talking about making sure things have been locked down. If it doesn't need internet access, port 80 and 443 should not be open. If it doesn't need remote access, RDP shouldn't be open. If it doesn't need access to the file share, it shouldn't have it. So really go through and harden those configurations to limit. Unfortunately, uh, you know, most operating systems out of the box are way too open. I'll pick on Windows because it's the most open. A default install of Windows 10 has about 90 things turned on that I would never want turned on if I was using it for school purposes. So go through and harden. Uh, there is, uh, and Nicole, maybe you can Google and throw this in the chat. It is called a STIG. It stands for Secure Technology Implementation Guide, and it is put out by the Department of Defense. And what that guide is, is all the group policy settings and configuration settings that you would make to a system to harden it. Now, caveat, do not attempt to apply the full STIG. You are not a, a level four classified you know, agent of the CIA, and if you are, don't nod your head right now. Uh, you don't need that level of security but there's a lot of great stuff in there that can help you harden your system with very little effort, very little effort. Um, so go ahead and do that. Uh, be prepared to re-image and rebuild systems. Uh, that, so if, if you haven't made a new gold image for your builds this year, do so. Be ready, you might need it. Almost always ransomware events are cleaned up by disaster recovery. That's another plan we're not gonna talk much about here, but it's super important to have and is part of incident response planning. So learning continuity plan is one of them and a disaster recovery plan is the other one. Incident response sits in the middle of those two. So make sure you have those plans in place that you have backups and image ready to go. Uh, pro tip, build an image, patch it to most current version and then save that image. Uh, I've seen too many districts that their gold image you know, was last updated two years ago and they go to restore and they find out they've got, you know, a 20 hour patch window that you need to sit through. So make sure that gold image is patched up to current patch at the time that you save it. And I encourage you at least every couple of months to revisit rebuilding that gold image uh, or at least updating the one you have with the current patches. Uh, when you do have an event, you need to increase the monitoring on that system. So any system that's been affected or impacted, you need to aggressively monitor for about six months. Uh, you will monitor this system at its highest level of monitoring. Uh, every single activity, every single log, you'll do that for about six months. You want to do that because reinfection does happen. Uh, sometimes we don't get it all the way out like we thought we did. There's a little residual left behind, or maybe the bad guy used a, a technique uh, that is um, uh, not 
very common or you know uh, perhaps they have a custom version of malware we don't have a signature for or something like that so make sure you increase that monitoring this is also a great time to implement additional security tools so if you don't have mfa if you're not doing antivirus anti-malware if you're not doing intrusion prevention uh, and intrusion detection on your network if you're not doing these things this is a great time because strangely enough in the middle of a crisis the budget magically opens up it's fascinating how much money becomes available to solve problems when the problem is happening and affecting learning. Use that opportunity to strike when the iron's hot and get that additional security protection you need, uh, especially if the insurance is footing the bill. You might as well take advantage of it. Uh, a lot of times you're going to need to modify processes. A lot of times, uh, so let's pick on direct deposit scam. So that's one you heard about earlier from Marsh, where a district had all of its payroll redirected to offshore bank accounts. There is a one single way to prevent that from happening, and that's called manual verification. You go to the payroll team and you say, if anyone requests a change to their bank routing, you need to get on a video call with them and verify face to face. Uh, in the old days, I'd tell you to walk down the hall, but I know that could maybe be an option or not. So in our, in our pandemic world that we're in, video verify. Look that human being in the face and say, did you do this? And if they did this, like, yep, absolutely. Okay, no problem. Process the request. 98% of the time, they're going to look at you and say, what? I didn't do that. That's not me. So just adding a step in the process. And notice that that step isn't even technological. It's a human step. It's just, hey, did you? Do you know? and, and normally I'd say pick up the phone, but sometimes the phone numbers aren't right or could be spoofed or whatever. And and it just with, with, with deep fakes and some of the voice stuff that's for everybody that's using Clubhouse, just know just wait that data will be used against you at some point so don't use clubhouse uh voices uh calls can be faked uh, that technology is getting really really good so video verify face to face uh and then activate your disaster recovery plan if you're truly in a bad situation this is this is what you're going to need to do to recover and again if it's too much it's too heavy you're unsure you need it to happen faster than you think you can get it done call in outside help call in the pros uh to help you do this uh, questions you're going to need to answer. When can systems be returned to production? That's going to be one you're going to get asked a lot. How long till this is behind us? How long till we have it back? Uh, again, have you patched and hardened? Now you see me just beating this drum over and over and over, and I'm doing it because it's the number two thing you can do to prevent ransomware. So number one is to protect against is make an offline backup, air gapped. Number two is make sure everything is patched to the latest patch level. And then, you know, uh, can you restore from a trusted backup? So back to that air gap backup that I can trust, and I trust it because it's been off the network, and I know the bad guys haven't gotten to it. Um, you know, you're going to need to look for certain things when monitoring. Um, some of the stuff you're going to want to look for when you're monitoring these systems during that period of, of more aggressive is uh, successful logins. Right, so you, you want to track unsuccessful and successful. So for me, if I see three failed and a successful, that's somebody that's not typing their password well. If I see six failed and a successful, that might be suspicious. So I'm going to investigate that. I'm going to look for large movements of data. I'm going to look for that system accessing things that is not previously accessed. These are all red flags that would tell me something's going on in that system. Uh, and then we want to make sure we've we've acquired appropriate tools uh, to make sure similar attacks do not reoccur. So FIM is file integrity monitoring. Um, it, it, I encourage you to have it that that alone can let you know if a file becomes modified for ransomware before it even finishes encrypting it. So you can get an early alert. Hey, somebody's messing with this file. Uh, IPS is intrusion prevention system. Uh, this is a network technology that would alert you when it sees behavior on the network that appears to be someone trying to break in. An intrusion detection system is, is a sister technology to that that notifies you when it sees behavior of someone already having broken. A SIM is a security, event, a security incident event manager. Uh, this is software that tracks all these different log events and things and helps you build a picture of uh, do I have any kind of security event happening? And then a SOC is a security operations center. And what this is, is it's folks like myself uh, who are uh, manning the keyboard. We are defending the network. We are responding to security incidences 
on your behalf. Um, if, if you're a Sophos customer today, I encourage you to call them and ask them about their managed detection and response program. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job for the districts that I consult with uh, at a price point that is very palatable. And um, it just, it's, I don't endorse much, uh, but that one I will put my name behind uh, because they've been doing a phenomenal job. Um, and if you, you know, are curious about things like data loss prevention and managed detection and response, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, but you will want to start thinking about those types of technologies going forward uh, because you're going to run into a bandwidth issue where you have more security events happening in a given day than you have an ability to react or respond. So use those third parties where you can. Any questions before we get into lessons learned? Um, Ryan, I'm going to jump in quick. Um, there was a question about, um, you know, having a lot of data in the cloud or web systems, but I'm going to expand on that today. We have a lot of, in schools, critical data that resides with a third party, right, provider. Um, how, what is our, you know, talk about briefly our responsibility in making sure that those vendors are doing the things that you're talking about in terms of backing up and, and protecting that data uh, as well. And then I say, you've got about 10 more minutes. <laughs> okay, good, I'll talk even faster. Um, okay, so here's what we've got. Uh, when it comes to vendor management, you need to treat all vendors as if they are the district, period. Hard stop, same rules apply. Uh, you need to do vendor assessments, risk assessments on them, that's very important. Uh, I will I will endorse obviously Security Studios product because I helped build the thing, so I know it's super thorough. Uh, it's probably one of the most robust and thorough vendor risk assessments in the market today. We ask the hard questions, the really hard questions. So you need to do that. You need to do a vendor risk assessment. You need to make sure contractually. And this is very important. And a disclaimer: not a lawyer. Talk to your lawyer. You need to know what's in that contract. That contract a lot of times can indemnify them from that responsibility, put that responsibility back on you. You need to make sure that contract language supports student safety and protecting of the data and that they know that they have uh, skin in the game. And for vendors that refuse to work with you on that contract, uh, I advise districts to put them on notice. Uh, I've got a district right now that just kicked four vendors out because they would not play ball the right way. And so they said, fine, I can't get rid of you today, but I'm putting you on notice that if this isn't solved by the time contract renewal comes up, we will not be renewing. And then they began to explore other options. Uh, and for those vendors, they chose not to play ball. Uh, they lost those contracts. And strangely enough, after that happened to them a handful of times, magically they changed their ways. So hold them accountable, do the vendor risk assessment, know what their habits and practices are, Make sure contractually that they're obligated to notify you as soon as they suspect they have an event happening. That needs to be in the contract language itself. Um, and follow up on them, keep up on them. Don't just ignore them, treat them as part of the same district protection that you apply to every other aspect of the district. Because ultimately they are responsible for student safety, but legally you are on the hook. You chose to do business with them, therefore you're the one responsible. So make sure uh, that you have done that due care and due diligence. All right, so lessons learned, here we go. Uh, what do I need to change, right? What changes do I need to make to the district security based upon what I've learned? Uh, maybe it was, we learned that we needed MFA. We learned that multi-factor wasn't in place and had it been in place, we wouldn't have had the problem, so now we need to make that change or maybe we need to revisit our contracts with our vendors, or maybe we need to uh, do more effective security awareness training with our staff or create an incentivized reporting program or something else. So what do we need to change about the security habits of the district to make sure this event doesn't happen again? How do we train our employees different? Uh, I encourage you guys to go check out Wiser Free Security Awareness Training. Uh, I love it, it is one minute cartoon videos and they are highly effective and they are from a personal perspective. The more we keep trying to do this from a workplace perspective, the more it's just gonna suck and it's gonna fail. Change the dialogue, make it about at home, make it about protecting the family, protecting themselves. Wiser free security awareness training, phenomenal stuff. Um, 
you know, look at what weaknesses the, the breach exploited. Did it exploit the fact that our, our security awareness training was not as strong as it could be and therefore someone clicked a link? Did it exploit that our patch management program wasn't as robust as it could be and therefore they were able to exploit a vulnerability? Uh, do I have a guest network that's wide open and there's a VLAN that allows the guest network to traverse to the core that I didn't know was there because it was put in by a high school student last year when I wasn't looking? So we need to know what weaknesses get exploited. Uh, we, we have to be sure that the same pattern doesn't happen twice. Uh, this is very important legally, very important from the insurance company. Everybody's totally cool with you having a security event. It happens. Nobody's cool with you having the same exact event twice. That's called negligence. So you have to stay away from that. Uh, what updates do you need to make to the incident response plan based on your learnings? And how are you going to rebuild community trust? And that's a, that's a big one. How are you going to rebuild that? Because you have an event, you will lose community trust. It may be only for a few moments. Uh, our attention spans are pretty short these days. Uh, but it might be bigger than that. Or you might lose staff trust. Or you might, you know, uh, your vendor might cause you to lose trust. So, you know, it's important to understand how you're going to rebuild that. Uh, make those necessary changes. Implement security training for all staff. You should be doing this more than annually, and please, I beg you, stop doing it at the same time as bloodborne pathogen paperwork. Everybody is fried on that day. Their brains are fried. They're sitting there checking check boxes, going through HR. You know, don't don't touch the coworker training, bloodborne pathogen training, don't touch the student training, and all the other stuff. And we check, 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 check. If that's the day you choose to do security awareness, honestly. And candidly, just don't even bother because it's that it's so ineffective. Their brains are cooked. Do it on a different day and, and try to do it quarterly. Quarterly is far more effective than annually. And again, incentivize. First one to get it finished with a good score gets a candy bar. Heck, I'll even donate some candy bars to you just to help make this easy. Reach out to me. I'm happy to send some Snickers your way. It'll make everybody better. Um, Please do conduct a comprehensive security assessment. Work with ECMEC. Okay, they have they have the tool, they have the know-how. They've been working very closely with us. We we have spent a lot of time making sure that they are doing this the right way for schools that aligns to what we would expect as reasonable best practice in the industry. So work with them. Uh, if for some reason you don't want to, find find somebody, but make sure you're getting this stuff done. Uh, you want to make sure you're taking steps to prevent a similar breach. So again, I've seen it where, where two breaches happened within, within four months of each other. And it looked a lot at the beginning like they were the same thing. But because the district was able to prove that they had done certain steps and they had those emails and documents, uh, the insurance company actually paid a second time because the breach was different enough. Had it been the same as the first one, they wouldn't have paid because they were very clear you need to fix these things and change these things. Uh, update the incident response plan to include the learning from, from the event and then address any policy or procedure gaps you have. So again, policies matter, procedures matter, um, super important. Here's an example of some of the ones I would expect you to have. So a uh, policy around why you've collected data, how data gets created, how it's used, how it's disseminated, how it's stored, how it's maintained, uh, your data breach notification procedure. Now in Minnesota, you have a legal obligation under chapter 1305, again, not a lawyer, 1305, Minnesota State Legislature says as a political subdivision, which is how a school is treated in the unit of government in Minnesota, you guys are considered political subdivisions, are required to disclose, and this is my favorite word, within a reasonable amount of time when you have a security event affecting more than 500 folk. Uh, caveat, in the United States of America, there are 49 other states that have laws. When a student leaves your district and moves to another state, if you still have data on that student, and they're now an adult living in another state, that is no longer a student record, that is data on an adult in another state, and you will have to follow the breach notification laws of the state of residence of the person at the time of event. So that's a mess. I encourage you as often as possible 
to de-identify or purge data on students no longer in the district, especially if they're graduated. I, there's lots of valid reasons why we may not do that when they're still in primary or secondary because, you know, maybe they just moved the next town over and they're going to come back and whatever. But if they've graduated and moved on, they're no longer a student, there's very little reason for you to keep their personal data. Yes, you want to keep statistics. You want to show that the class of 2021 performed this way. And so I need to know what, what Johnny's grades were from an aggregate, but I don't necessarily need to know Johnny specifically. So make sure you're cleaning that data up. Uh, as the as we see legislation get stronger and federal laws coming, uh, this is gonna become a bigger issue. The other piece is, uh, and we have not, and again, talk to your lawyer, we haven't seen them sue yet, but technically, if you have a foreign exchange student that is a European citizen, you are technically beholden to GDPR or the General Data Protection Rule, which is a European law that is very strict about what security controls you have to have in place and how you go about dealing with data and reporting data. Uh, the law says all European citizens receiving service, regardless of the country in which they're receiving that service from. Now, again, we haven't seen anybody sued yet. We don't know how this plays out in US courts. Talk to your lawyer but it wouldn't hurt you to start thinking that way. Uh, oh, lastly, uh, so uh, that's a notification. And then destruction of data. Go to NIST, Google this up. It's NIST 800-88. And what this is, is a guideline for how to appropriately destroy data on given mediums. How you destroy data on a physical spinning hard drive is not exactly the same as on a solid state hard drive. And it's not the same as on paper. It's not the same for removable. So you want to understand what that destruction requirement is. And the other thing you want to do is hold your vendors accountable to destroying data to that standard. Them saying I deleted it is not an acceptable answer. That's not good enough destroyed it to what specification, to what level? Because there's there's destroyed for reuse, and then there's, I put it in a chipper shredder, and they are very different things. Uh, if you just format a hard drive, I can pull every bit of data off it, no problem, if all you've done is format it. I can just recover the whole drive in three mouse clicks. Okay, so it's important because when we recycle our equipment, we trust that recycling vendor to purge, we have found that a lot of those recycling vendors are just taking the equipment they get from you and then selling it on eBay and they didn't even wipe the hard drive. So make sure you hold your vendors accountable to destroying data to the NIST 888 standard. Uh, and with that, just a quick little, who the heck are we again? We, uh, we are the only uh, risk assessment platform who actually has a school specific risk assessment. So we, we take care of K-12 in a special way that no one else in the market does. Um, ECMEC partnered with us for a reason. We, we really care. Uh, hopefully my passion came through today and you guys can tell I'm, I'm super passionate about this. I love this work. I love working with K-12 and helping you guys to be better at this. The reality is, is, is you guys are in such a unique position where you have the amount of computing and data that the largest corporations on earth have and you have budgets more akin to my son's allowance so this can be a challenge right work with folks that care that want to help you there's tons of free resources uh, nicole can can attest to this i will answer any question anytime for anyone ever at no charge because I want you guys all to get better at this. I really do, I, I mean that from my heart. Uh, lastly, I'll tell you this, um, FR Secure, uh, our sister company, has an incident response retainer program. Uh, a couple things that are really nice about this program is that, it, think of it as, as insurance for the insurance. Okay? It's the ability to get highly qualified um, security professionals to step in and help you navigate your security incident. Um, the cool part about this service is that if you, let's say you sign up for your retainer and you are at month number 11 and you have not used it to deal with a security event, you can then apply the dollars to a different activity. 
You can apply the dollars to having FR help you with policies or procedures or designing your response plans. So it's, it's insurance that you can actually spend. Unlike regular insurance, where if you don't use it, you lose it. This is designed to provide you help. So if you don't end up using it within that one year period, you can actually apply that dollars um, to a different activity. So that's a nice thing. Uh, and then obviously we are ethical, transparent, super passionate people with a mission to make the world a better place. So with that, I think I'm right at time, uh, but I ask you this closing question. How do you protect your family from cybercrime? And if you don't know the answer to that, or you have more questions, I'm putting a link in the chat to a free personal risk assessment that we have uh, that will help you get better at home. And when I say free, I mean, we're not gonna send you marketing emails. We're not gonna sell your data to somebody. We do this to help because we care. And one of the nice features we recently added, and this is for all the parents on here, if you put in an email address, we will monitor the dark net for you and notify you the instant we see that email involved in a breach or a compromise. Now, when we think about our, our children, a lot of times they will use their school email to open up their second Instagram account or things like that. So this can also be an interesting way to keep an eye on those things. Uh, but we will do that at no charge uh, and it's an opt-in service. So if you don't want that, you just want to take the assessment and learn some, some better habits at home, you can do that as well. So with that, I, I thank you guys for the time today. I hope you learned something and I um, feel free to reach out to me at any point in time if you have any questions at all. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. Um, that was, uh, again, fabulous as, as it always is, as your presentations always are. Um, there are a few questions that came up. Uh, they're in the chat, Ryan, if you want to take a peek and, and maybe get a chance to respond to them. Otherwise, um, uh, I think we have your contact information somewhere so people can contact you directly with those, if that's okay with you. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put that, I'll put my email in the chat here. There you go. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Someone just reminded me that my camera's off. It's on now. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Ryan. Um, and uh, the question about will we include the chat notes with the recording? Absolutely, we will. So all the links and so on that are that are part of that will be uh, either on the resources page or in with the with the recording as well. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, a couple of other things. I apologize. You know, we always try to plan uh, to have plenty of contents because while while one of my gifts is filling awkward silence, I don't. You know, we don't like to have a lot of awkward silence uh, at an event like this. Um, so we're not going to get to the breakout room part, and I really uh, apologize for that. Um, but you can get together with your district counterparts because you've heard several times, and Ryan had a lot of things that sounded uh, very technical, but you also noticed <laughs> there were legal things, there were things involving communications, there were things involved in the planning process, and all of those involve more than just the technical staff. Um, so I, I, I urge you to get together with the other people in your district. I did put in the chat a link to an incident response planning template, um, and Ryan covered a lot of the things that are on that template. So if you look at that template, you'll recognize the things that uh, he mentioned uh, show up there. But that template is good. It's in school language. Uh, and it has a real rich set of resources for helping you walk through that planning process. That was in the chat. And it's also on the resources page uh, of the summit, uh, summit page as well. So you can go there. We have partnered with Security Studio, um, and Nicole uh, is uh, trained to do the assessments, and, and we're always willing to help people with that process. We're also always uh, willing to help just tell you what's available and, and some of the resources that Security Studio has and some resources that are other places that exist. And I think we have a poll um, that's up in the polls area that just asks, um, is before COVID, <laughs> um, we had had a plan to do some uh, risk assessment workshops. And, and they were, they would be like, they were really going to be a follow up to our last security summit. <laughs> but, uh, but then COVID happened. And so we sort of dropped that, that plan. 
but we are looking at potentially doing those again, um, perhaps in the summer uh, this year. And if you're interested, you hit yes, just that we get a, you know, if you're not hit no um, or don't, whatever you want to do um, on that uh, on that poll. But that would give us an, a little bit of interest or an idea of if there's an interest out there and we would put those together again and try to do them uh, now that we're past the, hopefully we'll be past the pandemic uh, sort of situation. Um, and then again, just again, another thank you to Ryan and Security Studio for giving his time to us today. Um, Nicole, do you have anything you want to add uh, as we wrap up? The only thing I want to add is I shared in the chat the S2 score gateway. What that is is it gives you the ability to do um, like kind of like the light version of the risk assessment. Um, just run through that personally for your district, and then it gives you like your your score and some very basic information. So that's a free tool that we can. Um, allow you guys to use as well. If you do that and you want to save whatever you get, the results, make sure you like print that to a PDF or take a screenshot or something because it is only available for 30 days. Perfect. Yeah, there's lots of great resources there. I did, I, I am sharing a screen right now. These are the uh, breakout room discussion topics that we were going to cover. Um, and and there's a second slide. Uh, go to that one. It's a bunch. It's some scenarios. These are like your tabletop activities to test your incidents response plan. These are on the slides. The slides are on the resources page, so you can go there and use these questions and scenarios as you get together with your own folks in your own district to either examine your existing incident response plan or develop a new one if you don't already have that uh, that plan. So I wanted to make sure that I share those out with you uh, again. And uh, anybody else any, with questions that you have here at the end uh, that you want to ask? Um, uh, we'll, we'll leave a couple minutes for that or practice my wait time. Hearing none and knowing that we're competing with a lunch, probably, this time we can't provide you with a lunch like we would do if we were in person. So sorry, you're going to go and provide your own now. But not uh, hearing no no questions or comments, we'll, we'll let it rest at that. I will say thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. We hope that there's some nuggets that you're able to take home with you uh, to bring to your district, to talk with other people in your district. Uh, and again, remember, you'll get a link to this recording uh, and so on when, when we're done. So thank you again, everybody, for attending. Uh, and have a great day and a great rest of the week. Take care.